God knows who else's yes. elbow that could possibly be. Sometimes, sometimes Zan's camera does some really interesting things, like it'll go up to the roof or off to the side. And oh, uh... Zan, Zan doesn't like to sit still. <laughs> <laughs> I I thought I had short attention span, so yeah. Not that I don't have a short attention span; it's that I have a short. You're hyperactive. Posterior tolerance for sitting for a long period of time. Got it. Got it. Sometimes I want to get up and get something to show you. Sometimes I need something from the drawer behind my computer. That's all right. Never that's all right. It's always a mystery. So I just uh, I can't sit still. I'm a fidgeter. Can't help it. That's okay. That's good. That's all right. That's, that's like right now. Look at this. We're moving because ooh, we're I, moving. Yep. So I get lip balm. <gasps> yeah, lip balm. Which is, which is in a little drawer with <laughs> Columbia. <laughs> I would, I would never have <laughs> expected that. I like, I you know, like in a hundred years, I would have never guessed you associated with lip balm and and uh, little uh, riffraff in Columbia f- action figures from Rocky Horror. All right, so uh, also a pocket knife in there and a Jimmy Junior from Bob's Burgers. So, okay. well, I've got a Dale Cooper here from my Funko figure. What a what a timely Funko yeah, figure! Yeah, you have. say, isn't this a timely reference? Because yeah, obviously we're going to talk about um, we're going to continue our discussion of the autobiography of FBI special agent Dale Cooper, my life, my tapes. And again, for those of us who missed us in episode 28, although kind of surprised you would listen to part two and not listen to part one, but you know, I'm cool with that. Whatever floats your boat. Don't make people follow your timeline, Charles. If you want to listen to this podcast, weebly wobbly, that's fine with me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, humans, you're so linear. Um, this is it again. With your one heart. Yeah, with your one heart and your, your like linear timeline and your and your uh, planet that still exists. Exactly, and your lack of regenerations and all that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> dying and not coming back as another actor. Come on. Yeah, what is that, human? What, what's up with that? Uh, what's up with that? So, Ooh, we what's regeneration. <laughs> Yeah, and all of a sudden, Keenan Thompson comes out of nowhere. Talking about Gallifrey. <laughs> I'm, and it, with his Jerry Curl hairdo. I just, I, I love that maroon suit. I think that's fantastic. <laughs> Saturday Night Live reference, in case you're wondering. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, then once again, still written by Mar- Scott Frost, brother of Mark Frost, published by Pocket Books on May 1st, 1991. And we're going to pick up where we left off in part one, oddly enough. Uh, with part four, which I like to call the FBI Academy years. That's what they are. That's what they are, conveniently enough. So this is essentially Dale um, getting into the FBI and going through what is essentially basic training for FBI agents at Quantico, Virginia. Yes, yes. It starts out with him making quick little entries in his audio journal about yes. how he took a written test and then did an interview and apparently he finished the written part of the test in record time of course and his interview was both factual and philosophical and the other agents in the interview were really impressed that he had an autographed photo of Jay <laughs> <laughs> so that's how, yeah, yeah i just love that he brought that up as a uh, like okay hey you know by the way i have an autographed photo of Jay i'm curious did he bring it up or did he actually bring it? You know, did he have like a briefcase or portfolio? It would, it would not surprise me knowing Cooper, if he had a briefcase with the autograph photo and showed it off to the agents. And then he was like, Oh, and by the way, yes. check this out. Yeah, and they exactly. was like, wow. <laughs> That's great. 
That's so funny. Oh, and and here's the letter too. Yes, exactly. Yes. Um, that's funny. So yeah. So by this time he's 23 year old years old. If case you're wondering, if you're doing the math here, um, because we find out found out in the previous uh, part that he was born in 1954, right. which again was five years uh, before Kyle McLaughlin, I believe. And um, at this point he finally gets his acceptance in the FBI. Told to report to Quantico on September 1st, 1977. So while all of us, the, as at least all of my generation, watching Star Wars at the movie theaters, Dale Cooper was in the FBI Academy. Square. Yeah, I know, right? Like, do the uh, Uma Thurman and Pulp Fiction. <laughs> Which is a rectangle. This is true. But, you're right. You're or, absolutely or right. Or you could do the you could do the L7. Or, yeah. Is- you know, kind of also a rectangle, but right. you know, you get you get what we mean. Yeah. So yeah. Don't be a don't be a idea. don't be a rhombus, okay? Yeah. <laughs> For the a little shout out to you geometry kids. Um yeah. so he gets he gets sworn in. Oh, and um before he goes, he spends a couple day a few days with his dad. He gets a letter from his brother Emmett. Now remember Emmett is the draft dodger hiding out. In Canada still. In Canada. At the moment, uh, and he calls Cooper. He sing, sends him a letter. He calls him a tool of the establishment who will rot in hell. It was good to hear from him, though. Exactly. Because Thanks, he bro. Was still, <laughs> he was still happy to hear from him. Which, when I read this, I started thinking, and I, I, you know, how you go through your entire day thinking, yeah. "Oh, I need to look that up," and of course, you never do because when you get to your computer, you think, "What was I going to look up?" Yeah. But I wonder what, if any, is the statute of limitations on draft dodging. That's a good question. You know, when when can you come back into the country after you've essentially broken federal law about the yeah, draft dodging? I yeah, I don't know what the statute is on that. Funny enough, I unlike our president, I never dodged the draft, so I wouldn't know. Right. That's the yeah, we are we are too young for it. We had exactly. we had our moments of being afraid of it with our right, right, right. first Gulf War and our everlasting war on terrorism. Yeah, that but, was my mom was a wee bit nervous during that first Gulf War. We were we were just too young, and then we were just too old. Exactly, so. exactly. So uh, on September first, he gets sworn in at the FBI Academy in Virginia, and while there, he meets a woman named Robin, who's uh, apparently in his defensive tactics and physical training class. Mm-hmm. And there, I guess he go under. A couple of days later, he undergoes a simulation, which ends up killing his partner, Robin, during the simulation. He because, feels really bad about this. And why does he feel bad about it? Because, surprise, he's attracted to her. Oh, no. What do you think? <laughs> which is the only thing I can say. The only right. thing I can say about this is I feel really bad because I know this is not going to end well. No, no, no. And now, to Cooper's credit, though, he does, he's like, okay, I can't go forward forward with this because it's just you know person he f- says personal weakness is going to lower my guard and but of course in typical dale cooper luck robin tells him that the attraction is mutual that's that is that is atypical of cooper's luck pretty much but they both decide okay this isn't the right time or place for it so they both kind of back burner to this for the moment for the foreseeable future here. And later on, about a few months later, which I kind of surprised that it only takes three months for him to graduate, become a special agent. Right. He accelerates through this program and yeah. graduates with honors and does very, very well. Yeah. But apparently though, he's not the valedictorian. He lost that to Robin. So I guess he's the salutatorian. Well, that's, she was a worthy adversary. She was also very good. Exactly. And that's so. probably Partly why he's attracted to her, because maybe she's a better agent than he is. That's possible. It certainly is. Uh, at this time, he gets a new pocket-sized cassette recorder from his dad. Which no, is the no, one I'm sure we all know, and the model we all know and love. I'm sure he's gone through a couple in his in his time. But Click. Yeah. Yes. Diane, I'm, I'm holding my, in my hand a small box of chocolate <laughs> so, bunnies. Exactly. Exactly. But it's but it's not about the bunnies. It's so not about the bunnies. Fun. It's not about the bunnies. Is it about the bunnies? It's not no, about it's the not bunnies. about the bunnies. But 
Is it about the monies? <laughs> because you, chocolate. You could go back and forth on that all day. <laughs> So uh, he gets his first assignment in the Pittsburgh field office. Philadelphia. I thought I thought it said Pittsburgh there. Oh, it is Pittsburgh. I'm I'm sorry. I was yeah. thinking about Philadelphia. Yeah, Philadelphia, yeah. 1989. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, he's assigned to the Violent Crimes Task Force. Gets an assistant. Gets an assistant. Well, we, yeah, we'll find that out. So, um, yeah, he now before. Um, before I guess he goes to his assignment, though Robin and Dale kiss on the gun range because, hey, who does doesn't get turned on at the gun range? That is adorable. Yeah, for two overachieving FBI agents to have their yeah. first kiss on the gun range. <laughs> it's love, true love, love with an Earth W. <laughs> gun range. Gun range is what brings us together today. Don't even start going there. <laughs> Do you remember what I said last week about Monty Python fans? Yes, I know. That goes double for Princess Bride fans. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> As you wish. As you wish. All right. <laughs> so uh, about a week before Christmas, he arrives in Pittsburgh, gets an apartment over a bakery. And that's essentially takes us to part five. Where, which will be essentially the FBI years, Pittsburgh. Yes. And so here he, um, about a day later, he spends his first day behind a desk. Not really impressed by that. I do love the other agent that is quoted at the beginning of this part saying that he remembers meeting Cooper because he had the cleanest gun he'd ever seen. <laughs> which, hey. you know, Cooper is just ducks in a row kind of guy. So I, I love that. Hey, now. All right. Hey now. Hey now. Um, he gets assigned to secretary. Well, as we know, being Twin Peaks freaks that, or Twin Peaks geeks, that uh, his secretary is none other than Diane Evans. Diane Evans. Although at this yes. point, at this point, Cooper doesn't know her last name. He doesn't, and he even mentions that later on in the in the probably narrative. That probably because the writers had never given her one at this point. They'd never given her one exactly. So, and for the rest of the um, the case that he's on, and for pretty much for the rest of this chapter, the case he's on, all of his recordings are addressed to Diane. Yes. It's more that he's dictating to her rather than keeping a journal. But this is yeah. what I think is interesting. Yeah is that the book tells you that there are a lot of things that are redacted due to security reasons, but we are able to hear this one case about the baby who was kidnapped. Right. That uh, Cooper is able to um, to solve, but it was pretty terrifying, and yep. Cooper is pretty shaken up by it. So Cooper might seem like he has, you know, an ironclad constitution and nerves of steel, but it does, things do get to him. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. So now he does say, though, that about Diane, or dictating his tapes to Diane, he says that, okay, I know I'm talking to myself, but I like the idea that maybe you're in the room with me. Right. So I think that... Cooper and Diane have always had a nice connection with each other. Yeah. I gotta see. I kind of theorized that. Okay, at first he was just dictating his tapes to himself, but saying Diane's name to kind of make himself pretend that he she's there. But then at some point, she starts listening to the tapes, right? Because obviously it's you know case and information or whatnot, and so maybe he just kind of starts dictating to her intentionally well and there are and, and as we know from the show yeah. he is asking her for things and telling her here's what we need to do and send me earplugs like you did on my right. trip to new york things yes. like that so he he does wind up realizing that she is part of this with him and will need to be privy to what he's saying but what i love is that the first time he ever really requests something from diane in his recordings right was to talk to them about where did they get this horrible bean they call coffee. First of all, <laughs> he's like, talk to procurement about what 
hellhole of a government surplus <laughs> warehouse they unearthed this blend from and what war it was captured in. Well, this Which is a bit, this is time, very this is very important to Cooper's world. And of course, at the time, this is nineteen nineteen seventy what eight. is it seventy seventy eight 78 78 at this point. Yes. So the United States hadn't seen a war in a in, in a good twenty five years. So yes. this is disgusting <laughs> coffee, apparently. And then the next request he makes of her is. Diane, what do you know about a special agent named Albert Rosenfeld, and why is he so angry? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> Which, unfortunately, is pretty much all we get of Albert. Yeah, in this yeah. Book. Now, you <laughs> notice, though, here, there's a little bit of a typo, because they spell Albert's last name Rosenfeld. Right, it's not Rosenfeld. Yeah, so he hadn't quite figured... Or Rosenflower. Or Rosen... Rosen, or Rosen... <laughs> yeah, as Andy liked to call him. If Andy I called him Rosen Rosenflower, yeah. yeah. No, Agent Rosenflower. Yeah, okay. And it's another fine moment in law of enforcement course. history. Yes, yes. That's great. Where did uh, he keep his water dish? <laughs> uh, I love talking to you. Uh, oh, I just love Albert so much. <laughs> he was so quotable. Um, all right, so, yeah, I guess this was all during a case this when he met Albert during a case where there's several fresh graves lined up in a row in an abandoned tenement. Mm-hmm. And one of the graves has a woman's hand extending out, presumably upward, kind of like a tree. Like or, maybe she's lying like, there. Like it's reaching. like an arm. Like an arm. Ooh, yes, I know. Ooh. Yes. I mean, there's no way in hell they could have predicted no, that. No, 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 like, no. I like to pretend I know something that's about a, them. Yeah, that would be a great connection, though. <laughs> yes. Yeah, she is the arm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or the evolution of the arm. The evolution of the arm. Yeah. The but abomination. Her, yeah, right. Uh, that's great. Um Three bodies, all female, between the ages of 16 and 30. And interestingly, Dale starts feeling the same evil force at work as the same one that he encountered while he was in college at Haverford. Mm -hmm. And there's a note here that there's a file in the case that's active, but all tapes pertaining to it are withheld. Right, this is what I was talking about. There are a lot yeah. of parts of the book that say that there are tapes about this, but they've been redacted right, from, right. from this transcript because, because they are the FBI. They were never released by the FBI. Yes. Right, they're, they're, they're matters of security or they're open cases or things like that. So yeah. now, presumably, what, knowing what we know now, maybe because if if this evil force was the same one, uh, maybe this was. Red- um, Redacted or withheld by Gordon Cole's instruction. Well, I think there's part of it. Part of it, too, is I think these murders, from what they sound like. Right. I think they're Wyndham Earl. Oh, OK. Well, so, if, well, remember, though, that whole case with Wyndham got folded into, um, you know, with Laura and everything. So that I kind of wonder if Gordon kind of like oversaw that as well presumably i think he did and at this point because he knew, because he could, because when knowing what um uh wyndham was like trying to glean all the secrets from the black lodge he was and i think that is it when this book was written in 91 yeah in if we we're thinking about this in the twin peaks timeline yeah. wyndham earl was still missing right so we don't know what where he is what happened to him just yet so we have these murders that are kind of weird and kind of like the ones that Cooper was suspecting him of. And I think I think Cole has just kept them, at least at this point, Cole just has them still as open cases with not just involving an open case murder, but, but involving a missing agent who has gone, well, he's gone a little funny in the head. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah. Um but that's yet to come in our in our discussion. Um, so Wyndham Earl shows up a couple months later to head the Pittsburgh office. And this is where he kind of recalls meeting Dale at that college job fair that we talked I think about it's last funny. night. Yeah, because Cooper says, I have the feeling we've met before. Right. And which which cracks me up because the way Cooper says it in the book is – I believe we have met before, and it's very a very sterile. You can yes. hear Cooper saying yes. in his very sterile voice, and that reminds me of uh, Robert Blake saying, "We've met before, haven't we?" Oh, 
from um, Lost, Lost Highway. Highway. Yeah. Yeah, Lost Highway. And so I, I, it, I, I think it's just such a great Lynchian style that there's this <laughs> kind of intertwining thing. Yeah. But what surprises me, it doesn't surprise me that Wyndham Earl remembers Dale. I'm surprised that Dale doesn't remember Wyndham Earl right away. Because I am you, too, because normally he's that observant. He's really observant. Ob- yeah. Observant. Easy, what, easy for you to say. Albert Rosenflower. <laughs> <laughs> um, he is very observant. It's another and, fine day here in podcast history. Podcast history. <laughs> <laughs> Charles, you don't know how right you are. <laughs> exactly. But not only was he very observant, he was in high school and he met a real live FBI agent who was possibly going to give him a job. So you would think he would remember Wyndham Earl really well, the same way I would have assumed that he would remember really well the FBI agents that he met as a child when he got to tour the, the FBI at the invitation of J. Edgar Hoover. Right. So I'm just surprised that that was... I am too. It doesn't really seem like like Cooper. It doesn't seem like Cooper. Yeah, yeah. it doesn't seem like... Yeah, so, but uh, yeah, there's a note here that Wyndham tells Dale that he's been following Dale's progress. Of course he has. Because of course Wyndham he Because he's all creepy <laughs> like that. He's creepy. He's a creepy man. He's creepy, creepy. So. And I love this. I love this one where he says that the owner of the bakery downstairs is leaving bear claws at his door every morning. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> and then he says, must remember to buy his wife a nice big sausage, which sounds so dirty. It does. It does. <laughs> Cooper, it just... It, Probably that overtone. I, I'm sure the writers were just like, "Yeah, this will be funny." And but I'm sure in Dale and Cooper's, you know, just naivete a little bit, he probably doesn't think get the double entendre from that. He doesn't get the double entendre, and you know that the next day there's going to be a knock on their door, and it's going to be Dale Cooper, very matter of factly, <laughs> passing over yes. a, like two pounds <laughs> of spicy Italian sausage, saying, "Here you are, Mrs. Baldini," and then giving a thumbs up and. Walking Thank away. you for the bear claw and just walking back home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then in like the the woman just like looks at her husband probably and is like, yeah. you know, that Shr- yeah, you know, shrugs or whatever, <laughs> or just takes the sausage and goes off into a private room or who knows. Um, okay. So we get a hostage situation at the Eastern savings and loan mm. and Wyndham Earl and Cooper get inside the, uh, the bank without resistance. Dale ends up shooting one suspect. The other just surrenders. Right. But and, he had to use, he had to use deadly force. Yeah. And, so this is essentially the first time Cooper's killed a guy. Yeah. And that's, and he's not happy about it. No, he knows he had to do what he had to do. Right. But he doesn't like it. Yeah. And apparently pure bureau guidelines, uh, he's given save several days off to deal with what happened. Uh, Wyndham Earl invites Dale over to his house for dinner and chess. Of course he does. Of course he does. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you come meet my wife, Caroline? Come meet my wife, Caroline, yeah. and come play chess with me. Exactly. And this is not going to end well. But yes, he gets flowers from yes. Diane. Already the he warning gets- signs is because we know what's what's going on here. Right. He gets donuts from Mr. Baldini. He's on leave for a while. He goes through psychiatric evaluation. Then he comes back on desk duty for a while so he can yeah. get back into the yeah. swing of it slowly. Yeah. So um, while he's off, Diane gives him, sends him flowers. Nice. Okay. Uh, Wyndham, in their first chess match, beats Dale in seven moves. Of course he does. Of course he does. Uh, Which yeah. is... Is interesting because we then later find Dale and Cooper in a chess match where he's trying to win in as many moves as possible. Right. Because every time Wyndham take, takes a piece, he kills a person. Yes. Right. So he when, wants to keep that going right. as long as possible. And, and he Cooper can. realizes that he's not going to beat or at least stalemate Wyndham Earl. So, so, which is why he brings in Pete Martell, the, the local chess expert. Right, and he's trying to get to a stalemate, but what does he figure out that he can't do it without yeah. having at least two moves? Yes, or something like that. So yeah. it's, he's like, I don't know what to do. We're, you know, we're, there, there's right. got to. I mean, something he can minimi- gonna happen. Min- he can minimize the loss, but not totally. You know, apparently some people will die. 
but it gives them some time to try to track Wyndham Earl down. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so Cooper meets Caroline, of course. Now, Caroline pulls him aside a little bit and says she hopes that uh, the shooting, Dale's shooting, won't affect his life the way that it affected Wyndham's. So, and Cooper says, like, what she meant. Oh, we're going to find mm, out. So, yes. So, apparently, um, presumably, yeah, the, the, the big... Des- the the beginning of the descent for Wyndham Earl was when he shot and killed someone. That sounds like what Caroline's trying to tell Dale. Right, that this right. Is, this was the beginning, or at least, that, that, or at least that's what she thinks. Maybe it was something before that. Well, and if he's interested in the Black Lodge and interested in all that kind of yep. supernatural evil and darkness, I'm wondering. Was he touched by Bob at some point too? I that's, know we've always wondered that's, that about that's, Wyndham that's Earl. What I'm thinking. That's kind of what the book infers, I think. Well, and Wyndham Earl sort of does that thing where he knows a little bit about something right. that he thinks he's into and then wants to be a part of it. Yeah. And then the entity that he's worshiping basically lays the smack down and says, hello. Yeah. I think but I think Bob was probably there's just only like, room in this in this lodge for one of us, you know. Yeah, I'm thinking Bob probably gave Wyndham Earl a taste, but once Wyndham's ambitions got the better of him, he's just mm-hmm. like, "Oh, wait a minute here, Sparky." Right, right. And like, I will take your soul. You can't have your soul. I will take you. Yeah, that. And he, and that's the thing. It's almost as though Wyndham is aspiring to be Bob. Yeah, but he's, but he's too. But, he's, but it. But Bob is just so way out of his league. Well, and Bob is so patient and ancient, and yeah, exactly, just pure absolute evil. Whereas Wyndham Earl still has this faint glimmer of humanity, yeah, left over. Where part of his motivation is revenge, right? And you can't want revenge on someone unless you love something at one point. Yeah. And so he still has that humanity in him, whereas Bob has no humanity. He's just doing evil things for the sake of evil. Well, yeah, he's just he wants to kind of torture people to, and feed off their fear. Right. That's his agenda. That's his agenda. It has nothing to do with because he's essentially any other like a fear. Of, he's a fear vampire. He's a fear vampire, and he has no humanity whatsoever. Right. Um, Cooper has another weird, wacky dream. This time of a man with no legs sitting across from him in a green chair. He says nothing. What is it? And how do I stop it? Yeah, pretty much. He says nothing, then begins to laugh, tells him he can't run, that it, whatever, and this is it in capital letters, uh, it is right behind him and sure to kill. And no, it's not probably Pennywise. No, it's not Pennywise. (laughs) It's not Pennywise. Or a giant spider. Or a giant spider, yes, exactly. So Cooper wakes up to the sounds of screaming. Maybe it's his screaming. Uh, he starts questioning, what is it and how do I stop it? And who is this legless man? Good question. We don't get an answer. No. Because we know an armless man. Well, we know a man with one arm. Right. But we don't know a legless man. No. And yeah, yeah that's weird. That's, it was just it was kind of a very random thing that was thrown mm-hmm. out at this. Uh, yeah, so Cooper gets back on desk duty. Uh, apparently, after his psychiatrist sticks his head in the oven and turns it on, and, which and Wyndham is apparently the one who got Dale back. Well, gee, I wonder if Wyndham Earl put the old whammy hypnosis whammy on the psychiatrist. See, or, that's the only or or thing. Wyndham killed the guy. Or drugged him or whatever, stuck his head in the oven, made it look like a suicide. Or is what Dale is discussing with a psychiatrist that horrific that certain mental constitutions can't take it in yeah. any shape or form? Maybe, maybe. I don't know, or, because or, we have things that are coming up here. Mm-hmm. You know, all of these people getting killed and their hands chopped off. Yeah, and there's some really that, dark stuff coming up. So that's Wyndham. St- stay and tuned, Wyndham kids. Yeah, and so this this whole Wyndham thing is just going to get weirder and weirder really fast. Yeah, it is. Um, so Wyndham Earl and Cooper become partners, which I think, of course, was Wyndham's plan all along. Probably. 
part of his game. Uh, it appears he has been watching him since he was in high school, so right. he's probably been. So he's he's just play basically his manip- claim. yeah he's manipulating events to get him close, and presumably trying to get him. Which he, we know that he later tries to get Cooper closer with Caroline. Right, his as part, all as his, part of his kind of dementia or you know derang- all his derangement, master evil plan. It's, yes. He's like one. He's like one a one man demented evil. My evil plan. Freaking, freaking laser beam. <laughs> yeah. He he's like can, what is, can what is I that get, website? Can I get some dancing dwarfs with freaking laser beams on their heads, or <laughs> or white horses with freaking laser beams on their heads? Uh, <laughs> throw me can't a frick, do that. Throw me a freaking bone here. Well, what do we have? We have a one-armed man in an evil tree. What? And it's electric. It's electric? Frickin', throw me a freaking bone here. Been asleep for 25 years. Need the info. But he, what is that there's, website? There's, there's a great mashup potential there, I think. There is some pretty good mashup potential there. What is that website that you can pay like $10,000 and they orchestrate coincidences for you and the woman you're stalking? <laughs> What is that? I forget what that is, but that's what Wyndham Earl is like. That probably. he's probably been orchestrating this from the beginning. Oh, I'm he... sure. I'm sure. And I just wonder, it, would it have been any other kid from any other high school, or is there just something that special well, about Coop? Well, maybe, they, maybe there is. Well, maybe it was when he met him at the uh, job fair, and then he's just well, he's just like, hmm, maybe this kid's got something. So he kind of at that point maybe maybe started paying attention to him at that point. Yeah, Cooper is like very, maybe very special. Like maybe saw some talent in him or got a vibe off him or something. Well, and there's probably a vibe because Cooper does have that second sense. Exactly, you know, that, yeah. That, that, that third eye. That gift, whatever you want to yeah. call it, yes. That, exactly. That, well, he, he's sens- yeah, he's that sensitivity to the supernatural. Right. Um, and he's almost kind of precognition, as we talked about it, inherited it from his mom. Mm-hmm. Who was also kind of the same way. Yeah. Um, so they, they, there's another case, the body of a male, approximately 30, with wrist tied behind his back. And hands cut off. And sometimes my arms bend back. I feel like I know her. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, shot once in the back of the head, so kind of execution style. Hands cut off, teeth smashed, face destroyed. Isn't that how Leo Johnson died, too? Wasn't he shot in the back of the head? Oh, I have to go back. Jeez, yeah, yep. Jeez I only read these books a couple months ago. I, I know, remember. I know. We didn't need to pull out. And the... I was so excited about Leo being dead. But I should remember the details but, of but it's worth going back to reading um, Albert's autopsy of Leo Johnson. In, oh, in, that is so worth it. In the final dossier. It's, you know, it's always worth going back to that one. Um, so Dale speculates maybe it was organized crime. So he gets a call from Wyndham Merle to meet him in an area frequented by crime figures and here's where things go sideways a little bit, or quite a lot, actually. Dale detects a tone to Wyndham's voice he's never detected before. Mm-hmm. So he goes there, finds Wyndham's car. Wyndham Earl is nowhere to be seen. Hmm. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. Goes into an abandoned building, finds Wyndham's wallet and ID. He comes. Mm. He comes across it later. Uh, comes across a door with a large X drawn on it in chalk. Apparently, Fox Mulder stopped by. <laughs> yeah, I thought about that too. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's in chalk. It's not in tape on a window, yeah. but still. Well, actually, kind of Fox Mulder shows up a little later in this book, but we'll talk about that. Um, he's, dressed, he's dressed a little different. He's dressed a little differently. Yes. Yeah. Um, the room is empty except for two severed heads. You know, as it happens. Uh, they appear to have been refrigerated because, hey, who wants to like a rotting head, right? Uh, no sign of Wyndham, though. The, uh, Cooper calls uh, Caroline. Uh, apparently, Wyndham received a call the previous night around 7 p.m. Then he left their house, telling Caroline not to wait up for him. He didn't say who called. And uh, then another body is found, the same as the first one. And lab reports on the first body say the wounds were, wounds and severing were inflicted while the victim was still alive. Yeah. Yeah. Which definitely sounds like a Wyndham Earl kind of a pretty thing. Much. He's definitely into torture, as we've seen. Pretty much. Pretty I mean, 
I'm glad Leo Johnson's dead, but I do think him being tortured was a little unfair. Yeah. So the fingerprints on the severed hands were, belong to Louis Dante, a minor crime figure. And by this point, Wyndham Earl's missing for 24 hours. Cooper gets a call that tells him to go to abandoned barge in the Ohio River. Hey, shout out to the Ohio River. And to come alone. There he finds two severed hands, but one hand holds a small black square of cardboard, while the other holds a white square. Mm. Black and white. Now, where have we seen that before? Black and white, and I wonder whose hands let's these see, are. Let's see. There, you mean black and white, like on a chessboard, or maybe black and white, like in a lodge somewhere? Definitely with, like, number with a chevron the floor. I think this is definitely a chessboard. Which one is which? Which one right. do you because, pick? What's well, your these move? are squares, so yeah, it's probably yeah. a chessboard. I um, think this is a what's your move, Cooper? Pretty much, pretty much. But it, Dale's not quite connecting the dots yet. Well, I think Dale is. Maybe his subconscious is. Well, I think maybe his subconscious is, but I definitely think he doesn't want to believe the worst of Wyndham Earl. Mm-hmm. Because I remember he did like Wyndham Earl when he first met him, and I think he wants to believe that his partner is good, especially. And I think, I think there's a part of him that wants to believe that for Caroline's sake. Right. So on August 3rd, 1978, big moment in Dale Cooper's life, Gordon Cole, Gordon Cole, (laughs) the deputy director of criminal investigation division arrives to oversee the investigation. Dale has his first meeting with Gordon and goes over the case with him. So if you're Mm -hmm. now, you know, trivia bus, what day they met Uh, when they met and he gets a thumbs up from Gordon. Thumbs up. Uh, Then Gordon just takes off for Washington. Caroline, meanwhile, receives a communication from Wyndham. He only says, I'm sinking. I'm sinking. And they can't quite figure out what that means. And the call call gets cut off, of course, at that point. Yes. Yeah. Um, as Wyndham Earl keeps manipulating everybody. Dale puts a tap on the phone without Caroline knowing because, hey, that's legal. Uh, uh-huh. Yeah. Um, the call apparently came within the area code. That's all you can get before the call was cut off. Uh, second victim is identified as Jimmy Lester, a minor thief with a long list of arrests. The connection between the two victims is unknown. Now, mm. my theory on that, why he chose those guys, maybe it was like two guys that Wyndham Earl happened, you know, you know, like they were previous cases of his maybe. And so maybe he thought, well, hey, um, what better way to kind of get revenge on guys that I couldn't, that weren't. That's. That you know, was you was know, like maybe it's just like, well, these were unsolved cases because they they lack of evidence or something, right? Or that is a typical problem with organized crime yeah. is that everybody does one not really illegal thing to come right. together to make a big illegal thing, so yeah. it's hard to pin any one thing on one person. Right? It's all it's so, all um, kind of compartment uh, compartment. Com- Compartmentalized. compartmentalized thank you yes that word see i'm having trump fun too today what is in the water today i don't know well see i'm having tea so i can't really say but yeah it does have water in it water though. has water in it that um, is a yeah uh when it, all of a sudden though the next day shows up at the office the pittsburgh office and collapses he's taken to central medical you know, it, you know, the offices of the FBI in Pennsylvania in general. Right. People just walk in. People just walk in. <laughs> and, and freaky disappear. stuff. Yeah. Yep. They, 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 they don't show up on the, like, you know, the cameras or. Cameras don't work. They just fall in and out of existence. They pass out. Right, they right. they teleport from the elevators, you know, stuff like as you, as it happens, you know, things. This is this this is one nutty FBI. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, it's Pennsylvania, so you know. I gotta, as a as a Browns fan, I'm always skeptical of Pennsylvania. But as well, you should be. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so uh, I guess a day after that, Dale ends up recording a conversation he has with Wyndham Earl, which is all kinds of trippy, as you mm-hmm. might expect. Uh, Cooper asks him about the, the last four days. Do you remember where you were? Wyndham's like, he's laughing. He says, cracks in the door. And I kind of wondered, 
Well, is that a reference to those dreams that Cooper and his mom were having about, like, don't let the man in the door? Don't let him in your room. Right. Yeah. So, so maybe that, the dreams are affecting Wyndham. Maybe. As well. Maybe. Cooper asked, what did you see? Uh, the, his first response is Dale Cooper. Mm-hmm. And then Cooper asks again, what did you see? And Wyndham Earl replies, the abyss, Coop. The abyss. We all know what happens when you look into an abyss. Yeah. yeah. It looks back into you. Yes. Yeah. Or, you know, it's just, you put on another James Cameron movie, one or the other. Well, either way. Yeah. Yeah. If you caught that reference. Uh, Cooper asks, what did you find there? Wyndham says, wonderful things. Wonderful things. Yeah. Place both wonderful and strange. And strange. Yeah. Wyndham suddenly loses consciousness. Yeah, right. Remembers nothing. Cooper wonders if his dream is connected. Oh, maybe. Uh, his dreams usually seem to be connected to things. Yeah, but maybe he hasn't quite worked out how that works yet. Like, it, yes, maybe he's not. He's not. He hasn't realized how kind of insightful his dreams can be. Right. Exactly. He hasn't figured out that his dreams. Yeah make sense later on right. or come true. Or at least later. will lead maybe him that... down a certain path or what have you. Right. Maybe he hasn't noticed that quite yet. Yeah. That's what I'm thinking. Uh, Wyndham says he looks forward to a nice quiet game of chess. That and... is so ominous coming from yeah, Wyndham Earl. Yeah, from what yeah. we know of Wyndham Earl, yeah. when he says something like that, that is just so ominous. That, that's his, kind of his Dr. Lecter moment. where he... That means somebody's <laughs> going to die. Pretty much. Yeah. It's not, it's not good news. Now, we get a notation here that follow-up investigations over the next four months are all dead ends with no arrests. Because it's Wyndham Earl. Exactly. Thank you. That's the thing. Thank you. He's, he's cutting people's hands off. Pretty much. And being all freaky, and we just can't. Yeah. It's like, like if you want to go back to Hannibal Lecter. suspect is right there. Yes. When do we begin to covet? We covet what we see every day. Right. Well, you know, so we don't even we don't even notice what's right in front of us. Yeah, well, if you're familiar with the Hannibal Lecter saga, you know that apparently he also led the FBI in a merry chase before he got caught, he or actually surrendered did. himself. So before yeah. he hit Will Graham in the side with an arrow. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, okay, this takes us to 1979, where Dale is apparently told to go on a vacation. He goes vacations at the La Casa El Corazon which is Spanish for the house of the heart. 10 days of forced exile. Yeah. Now here's the really creepy part. It's a small Island in Mexico where Wyndham and Caroline spent their honeymoon. Wyndham Earl's been going crazy for a long time. I think pretty much, pretty much. And things get a little even more. Or. Yeah. Or Mm -hmm. we know that there's Bob. But right. there could be other entities similar to Bob that have gotten to Wyndham the same way Bob got to right. Zealand. So, yeah, but he's he's had some problems for a long time, I think. Yeah. yeah, I think so, too. And what kind of what kind of masochistic craziness is it to go to the same place the woman you are surreptitiously in love with had her honeymoon? That's just masochistic. Right yeah, now. like, well, of all the places that Wyndham Earl could have recommended – or whatever. Uh, yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. Uh, just that's that's just a little too intimate of a recommendation mm, in yeah, my opinion. Yeah, pretty much. Well, the, the whole thing is creepy anyway. Uh Cooper meets an old man who taught Wyndham Earl chess while he's there. Well, of course he does. Mhm. He he says to Cooper, "La muerte," which is the death. Death. Yes. And then he leaves, but Cooper's not, you know, quite ready to let him just walk off yet. He follows him. The man says, there is death in your face. I can teach you nothing. Cooper says, what the hell are you talking about? And he says, that is the wrong question. Right. And then he takes off. Yes. So Then yeah. Cooper wakes up the next day to find a dead chicken stapled to his door, basically. Yeah. yeah. So we've course. got some some sort of voodoo Santa Rita right, kind of right, thing going right, on here. Right. Essentially, yeah. Essentially, it turns into live and let die. Um, <laughs> with oh. you know, uh, Baron Sunday with or Yafik whatever. Kuda, yeah, you need him. yeah, yeah. <laughs> or the Seven Up guy. Ah, 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 ah. Oh, Jeffrey Holder never yes. had it, never will. Yep. 
Jeffrey Holder, by the way. Yeah. First ever autograph I got at a convention. Really? Yes. Was he nice? He was so nice. He signed my Annie soundtrack. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I'm I always have had a soft I'm, spot in my heart for I'm, Jeffrey Holder. I'm very envious you, uh, you have his autograph, uh, especially now that he's dead. Yeah, he gets fast. Yeah, unfortunately. Uh, Cooper goes to look for the old man because, hey, well, yeah, he might be the, your initial suspect of who nailed that chicken to your door. Mm-hmm. Uh, finds him in a small dirt floor shack, hanging dead from a rope tied to a rafter. A note left for him, for Cooper, presumably, says, Forgive, I was just a stupid old man. May God stop him. I'm assuming him in this situation is Wyndham Earl. Right, and you think, well, you know, if he's the guy that taught Wyndham Earl chess... Maybe he's referring to Wyndham Earl at this point. And what else did he teach him? Exactly. Yeah, we don't know yeah. exactly, but I'm sure it wasn't anything good. Um, so next day, Cooper realizes that he just spent the last 20 hours under the influence of a powerful narcotic. I'm not sure how this was delivered to him, but somebody did. And he feels something terrible has happened in Pittsburgh. Yes, and to to paraphrase, we're not paraphrase, but yeah. to quote um, Coach McGurk from Home Movies, <laughs> what is going on in Mexico? Nice reference. Thank you. <laughs> I, liked, is, I liked uh, Home Movies a lot. I loved Home Movies, yeah. yeah. That's funny. Oh, He's going to come after your mom. Oh, Brandon. Anyway. Yeah. So he has, yeah, he has a bad feeling that something yeah. is going on. I have a bad on. feeling about this. <laughs> Um, and apparently he is at the the um, Gilligan's Island Resort because of his phones. <laughs> right, right. So he can't do anything. And yeah. so what's has, funny about this yeah. is that he's he has this really bad feeling, but he says that what would make him feel better would be to be able to contact Winnie Merle. So either he knows that what's wrong uh-huh. is because of Wyndham. And he just wants to be able to talk to him and make sure that everything's okay. Because if he can talk to Wyndham and figure out that Wyndham is, yeah, I'm just sitting here at home with Caroline. We just had dinner. He can feel better about it. Or he's thinking Wyndham could help. And I'm leaning towards that he's figuring out that it's the former, that he needs to make sure he knows where Wyndham is. Because Wyndham is probably the source of whatever problem is going on here. Yep. So at this point, things get even more sideways. Uh, Cooper heads home, learns that Caroline has been kidnapped. Here we have our bad here thing we, that's happening in Pittsburgh, yeah, and yeah. here we have that this is probably what Emerald's doing. Yep. So here we go. Uh, this apparently happened the same time that Dale was drugged with a narcotic. Uh, while Carol, Wyndham, and Earl, Wyndham Earl and Caroline sat down for a meal. So mm-hmm. Supposedly, three men burst into the house well-armed. Wyndham was knocked unconscious. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm, I believe that as far as I can throw it. Pretty much, pretty much. Uh, while waiting for, hopefully, some news about Caroline, Dale ends up losing a, a chess again. Mm-hmm, this does not bode well for the no, future. No, no, Apparently the chess metaphors keep flying left and right here. A vagrant gets picked up wearing Caroline's sweater. That's a nice sweater. Mm-hmm. Uh, says God gave him the sweater. And he had an angel with a red face with him. Now, red, of course, like her face was all covered in blood, presumably. Presumably, yeah. yes. So, um, the, it was an angel without a sweater and screamed like a woman when yeah, God hurt her. Yes, that's a creepy. Which, that's a creepy line. You know what that makes me think of? Yeah, makes me think of Laura. Right. Laura with the angel screaming, and Laura and yeah. With with, the, the angels will never like hear her and all this. And yet. the angels won't save you. And yeah, Laura, with no shirt on, yelling at Donna not to wear her clothes. Right. So I just, for some reason, that just the, the no sweater and the screaming made me think of Laura. Yep. Uh, the vagrant was told by God to deliver a message. God is everywhere. Mm. Translation, Wyndham Earl is everywhere. Translation, yes. Yeah. Exactly. And... There's a code working here, but it'll lose me. God is everywhere. I think that is the key. Uh, yeah, Cooper. <laughs> you think? Yeah, I think. 
A uh, message delivered via secure telephone line is received at FBI headquarters in Washington. And the message goes, she loves him, she loves him not. She is not dead, but her love is. Caroline, Carol, Ka, C, gone. And Daryl... My fears yeah. that it may originate within the Bureau are growing. Yeah. <laughs> Have not spoken of this with Wyndham, but I must. Uh, no, you shouldn't. Yeah. Well, he's, he's, tr- he's desperate to find out what happened to Caroline. So he's got to, he's, you know, he f- probably feels he has to. Um, again, this is Cooper, you know, he's being the FBI agent. He's got to pursue every lead. Right. Um, so three days later, Wyndham Earl agrees to be placed under hypnosis. And we get a fun little session where Cooper is asking him, like, where are you now? Wyndham says, there is much light and is very dark. What do you see? Truth. Ha, ha, ha. Why were you taken there? I was not taken. I was chosen. And for what were you chosen, Cooper asks? Wyndham to be a good scout. To be a good scout. Now... I thought that was kind of interesting, considering Cooper used to be a Boy Scout. Well, and he laughs after he says that, so right. I think Wyndham is saying that to Cooper to relate to Cooper and almost poke fun at Cooper's ambitions. Yeah, I think so. Or just kind of needling him a little bit. Needling him a little bit, and then he tells him that you can't see it, can you? No, Caroline saw it. What was it she saw? Love and evil. Right. And he says, can you take me to where they took you? And, no. And yep. Yeah, and he says, No, you can't get there from here. Which yeah. Which I think I wonder if that means Which I guess apparently Wyndham Earl was listening to REM. I was thinking that exact same thing. <laughs> yes. Because every time I read We're I, totally in each I other's brains phrase, at this point. Yes. Every time I read that phrase, then that song's in yeah. my head. Can't get there. Yeah. Can't get there from here. Can't, from, yeah. can't get yeah. there. Yeah. So yeah, so thanks. Thanks for that, Scott yeah. Frost. Yeah. Appreciate it. <laughs> So can you not get there from here, like literally from Pittsburgh or from the room they're in? Or do you have to be in right. Washington State or do you have to be in a different state of mind? Well, or... of course, we know, having watched everything else, that he's probably referring to the Black Lodge. That's my assumption as well. Yeah. Because I think Wyndham knows something about the Black Lodge, but not enough. Yeah. Well, he does say he was – well, he says he wasn't taken. He was chosen. So I kind of wonder if he was brought to the Black Lodge. Above a convenience store? Above a convenience store, something like that, something like that. And so for the next two months, Caroline's whereabouts are unknown. And then in April of 79, um, they receive a report of Caroline's, a woman matching Caroline's description being arrested during a sweep of prostitutes in Lower Manhattan. Right. So she's the the thought is that she's been kidnapped, sold into human trafficking right. or brainwashed in some way. Right. So after a couple of misses, they finally find her. And we have a very similar situation here yep. where she's been apparently doing sex work and is suffering from heroin addiction. Yeah. So now and for, this, now for some re- way yeah. that this is related to um, the Renaults and Blackie but it is very similar to what happened to Audrey Horn. Yeah. Now they don't, there's not enough, nothing to really pin Wyndham down on this. So he ends up going with Dale to go ID her. So, so Mm -hmm. Wyndham isn't actively investigating this, you know, in quotes, investigating this with Cooper. And right. Yeah. Even though obviously uh, he's the one responsible for it. So works, works out great for him. Right. Uh, So he's, he's doing a really good He's yeah. doing a really good job of, you know, like you said, being the Hannibal Lecter of, yeah, you know, being the being the criminal yeah. but still staying on the inside. So yeah. Caroline, I don't know what's happening. Is, oh, that's weird. You know, huh? Well, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Who's hungry? Yeah. So Caroline, so, get, Caroline gets found. She's in in the interrogation room. She doesn't recognize Wyndham. No. And apparently, she's now addicted to drugs. And they do blood tests, and it is heroin. Right. And there, she's taken to Bellevue Hospital. Right. Which we all know is a mental hospital in New York. Yeah. And she's slowly but surely coming back. But Cooper thinks that she is trying not to fully come back. I think she's trying to stay a little guarded. Yeah. She eventually recognizes Cooper. 
And once she seems a little bit more stable, they're going to move her to a safe house out of the out of the mental hospital. Right. But she's not terribly happy to be seeing Wyndham Earl. He's she's confused by him. Right. And the way Cooper describes it is she knows who he is, yet at the same time, something seems to be holding her back. So it's like she's recognizing him as being the person everyone thinks is Wyndham Earl. Right. But she's also aware that there's something else going on with him. And something, he some, is, something that she's blocking. As it and he's out. responsible. She knows that he's responsible for what's happened to her. Yeah. And there was an attempt on Caroline's life, which mm-hmm. apparently there was um, – the same mystery drug that uh, was found in trace elements uh, during her blood test. With it, right, with and heroin. who, and who's questioning the staff of the hospital, Wyndham. So we're not yeah. going to find anything nope. because we know who did this. It's Wyndham. Right, but Cooper thankfully noticed the the change in color on the IV, and so they they caught it in time at this point. Um, Caroline wakes screaming and. Uh, says she saw the face of the man who abducted her. He was still coming after her, and but she knows she's going to die. And the, then he he does do a hypnosis session with her as well. Right. And they the lights go out, so she doesn't necessarily see who does this. Mm-hmm. But she says, it's dark, hands touch me again and again, stop, it hurts in the arm, it's sharp. And It's a very very Laura Palmer moment here. Very Laura Palmer moment, and it, you know she's being injected with a drug, and he, right. she says, it burns. I want to let my brain out of my head, hit it hard. And he says, do you remember any faces? And she says, yes, help her. He's dead. Right. So and they cut off his head and put it in her lap. Which Mm -hmm. might mess you up just a little bit. Might mess you up a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So. So after hearing all this, and this is where Cooper, you just want to kind of face palm at this point. He finds himself growing attracted to Caroline. Of course. Well, he has been, he's, he's known he's, well, he's been attracted to her for for the first time he met. He's always described her as a remarkable woman. Right. So I think now, because this because is, Cooper, yeah, this is a total head desk moment here. Did we did we ever determine what the clinical? Well, they call it the white. Like, well, well, they 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 term, white knight, white knight yes. syndrome. Yeah, Cooper definitely definitely has white white that's, knight syndrome. That's what um, Tammy. Famous. That's what Tammy speculated, and I think that's pretty dead on. After that's reading pretty, this, that's pretty dead on, and. We we saw that in the show. Mm-hmm. We saw that with Marie. We right. saw that with Laura. With, yeah. with Laura, we saw that with. I mean, just I mean, I mean, even talking about Cooper, yeah, from his young life, you know, with with Marie and and other girls that right. he has, or even with um, oh, what's her name? Was it Lena? The Lena, pirate Lena, yeah. 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 So he obviously has white knight syndrome, and it looks like she is developing a little bit of a Florence Nightingale syndrome here too. Right. And so this is very, very obvious. So, he's so like he got, she's gone, he through always, all, she's gone through all these traumatic events. Now, Cooper, you would think should be a professional enough to like, maybe this is not the best time to like try to pursue a relationship with this woman. But this is like to the nth degree. I mean, Cooper can't yeah. resist right. the woman who needs saving. Right. So not only has he started, he's, he's been attracted to her and at least intrigued by her since he met her. Right. And now that she has this sort of added bonus of needing saved, I just don't yeah. think he can resist. I don't think he can help himself. Well, and let's let's not forget that. Remember, Wyndham Earl was trying to push these two crazy kids together. Wyndham Earl is orchestrating this, so you know he's yeah. because he apparently had some paranoid delusion that um, you know that Cooper was attracted to his wife and vice versa or whatever. And then he wanted to prove <laughs> that was right. That theory was right by, acti- exactly. by actively pushing them together. So essentially creating a self-fulfilling prophecy, like we talked about. Exactly. So, so he can justifiably enter into his Monte Cristo. <laughs> like, see, yeah, I was right. I was right about that. Yeah. I was right. And I'm going to plot the most yeah. outrageously intricate revenge on you. Cooper. <laughs> So, I mean, you would just you would just think in the years 
that the Count of Monte Cristo was doing his thing, that he wouldn't stop and be like, dude, there is so much other stuff I could be doing with my time right now. <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, after a while, you'd be like, God, this is boring. <laughs> I, could, I could take up racquetball, you know, oh, okay, and some other stuff. Um, so, Wynn and Merle at this point, they're, they're in a safe house. They basically move Caroline to a safe house. Wyndham decides, okay, I'm going to leave the safe house because, oh, I'm afraid my presence will impede, is impeding Caroline's progress. Uh Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. We're not buying that for a second, but Dale does. Uh, Wynnum Earl tells Dale he believes evil exists as an independent life force and will eventually conquer good because of guile. At the end of all battles, only the victor is honored, and no one remembers whether he was good or evil, right. which I think is a fascinating statement because that's true. Right. That we tend to remember or we tend to want to believe that good will always triumph over evil because evil is dumb. Right. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, th- Yes, thank you. Thank you, Darth Helmet. <laughs> Darth Helmet, yeah. So I'm, dark, I'm paraphrasing Darth Helmet, Helmet there. Yeah. But we, we like to think that... And there are certain instances when, yes, that is true. You know, the Axis powers versus the Allied powers. You know, we had fascism versus freedom. Right. But but we 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 also we also had Hiroshima. You know, like the, the victors yeah. weren't always no. weren't always great people. So I'm just using I'm just using that as yeah. a as a as a as a very obvious example. Yeah. So. I think it's everything very everything isn't statement. so cut and dried. It's no, black, nothing's, it's not, nothing's totally bl- uh, black and white. All you do is you remember who won. There's just shades right. of gray. Right, exactly. Exactly. Or to or to put it in a completely trivial co- comedic yeah. terms. You know, John McEnroe's won Wimbledon a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> It's not the greatest guy in the world, although I no, do love John McEnroe. No, no. He's uh he has his moments of being kind kind of a dick. Yeah, so. kinda of, you, you think? But we remember his victories. Right. You know? Right. Um yeah, it's it's very easy to gloss over that. Yeah, we kinda of, we tend to try to overlook the bad stuff mm-hmm. in favor of the good stuff sometimes. Right. Exactly. Um, so uh let's see here. At this point, um Wyndham gets attacked. And, quote unquote attack yeah as he goes inside his house a superficial stab wound to the hand and arm see, so like see, like oh, cooper oh mentions that this is superficial right says to me that deep down cooper knows that this is Wyndham earl yeah maybe he's in denial about it at this point yeah like maybe his subconscious has figured it out but consciously he's not he just can't, can't do admit it. it can't admit it to himself i think because what's going to happen if it's Wyndham earl right then cooper's going to pick up Caroline and sweep her away right. and save her. And as much as he might want that, that's not the moral thing to do in his opinion. Right. So, well, the question he really should be asking himself, but uh, throughout all this is, uh, the typical investigators question who benefits. That's the thing. And at this point, when Merle benefits the most from all this, Mm-hmm. As we find out. Yes. Um, so uh, Cooper learns that his feelings for Caroline are mutual. Of course they are. Mm-hmm. Of course they are. They And so, they, yeah, she says uh, she loves him. They kiss, of course. Oh, they don't just kiss. Oh, well, yeah. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> There's that, too. Uh, yeah. Um, and somewhere he's. Winnemarle's probably watching on like some stocky camera thing. He's hooked up and going, see, see, I told you so. Mm-hmm. Um, Caroline wakes from a dream with a scream. She apparently saw the ma- face of the man who took her again. And she I ag- saw the face of the man who killed me. Yes. Nice. She agrees to try another hypnotic session in the morning, but bum, 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 uh, the there, next, is no morning there, is no, there is no morning because the next morning, Dale stabbed in the, once in the chest. Caroline's dead after also being stabbed. Mm-hmm. Wonder who <sighs> stabbed them. Hmm. Who's it con- was my husband. Yep. Who's connected to 
Caroline and Cooper. Hmm. Who, know, who knows where they are? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and of course, we know from right. the quotes I just did from the last episode that it yes. was, in fact, Wynnum Merle that yeah, did it. exactly. So. That was a very good Caroline impression, by the way. Thank you very much. You got the, you got the, the tone perfect. It's the best I can do without saying it backwards and then having it played. <laughs> yeah. Um, the FBI gets a frantic call from Wyndham at this point. A blood trail <laughs> indicates Caroline was killed in the bathroom, then dragged into position in Dale's arms. So the body was moved into Cooper's arms. Ooh, Wyndham Earl. Yeah, pretty much. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do like, you know, dolls here, essentially. Um, Wyndham supposedly was found in the kitchen clutching a phone. No arrests were made. Again. And he seems quite insane. Right. Dale wakes up in the hospital a couple weeks later, remembers little of the attack. Uh, Dale's dad and Gordon Cole arrive at the hospital. And Cooper believes he knows for the first time what love is because he lost it. So sad. I was going to say, that's such a tragic thing to say. Cooper's life is so tragic when it comes yeah. to love. Yeah. He can't win. No. Um, I hope, <laughs> yeah. I so hope yeah. that there's a little tiny part of Cooper that gets to know the love of right. J.D.E. and Sonny Jim. When he comes back home. He deserves that. Home. 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 Um, it's almost kind of like Laura Palmer in a way here. Because that uh, it just they feel that there's this they're, they're, they can't find happiness. That's very true. Well, at Dale, the difference is though, Dale just keeps. Well, he keeps plodding <laughs> along. He obviously doesn't like turn to drugs or anything like Laura did. Laura tried Whereas to. Laura... Laura, Laura had all this. Um, because of the abuse cycle that she was in. She considers herself unworthy of love. Right. Whereas Dale seems to be more like, incapable of well, love. Well, I, think, well, I think he wants to be, or at least in, acts like he wants to be, but, but he feels like it's never going to happen. There's always going to be something. And given his past, it's understandable why he feels this way. I can see that too. And not to sound too Star Trek about this, but yeah. Dale Cooper is a very methodical, scientific, logical mind. Right. Love is not that. Yes. Love no. does not make any sense whatsoever. No, no, not if you're doing it right. Not if you're doing it right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's why he has such a problem with it. That's why he's yeah, that's, not that's, able that, to. That's, that's a good point that maybe his, it just, his brain isn't wired for love. His brain isn't wired for that kind of whimsy. Yeah. Well, just or that or that kind of unpredictability. Yes, definitely unpredictability. Yeah. So, so poor Cooper. Yeah. Uh, and of course, poor Caroline. I mean, this is this well, is yeah, terrible. yeah, because she's dead. So yeah, poor her. Well, and she's you know she's also having those terrible feelings right. of well, in her last minute or moments on you know like last few days are just in this terror. Uh, right. Right. Because and, all the dreams and nightmares of being abducted and the you know and all this. She's, and, and, you know, she's surely dealing with the torment and conflict of feeling, oh, I'm finally feeling happy. I'm in love, right. but I'm betraying my husband. And even if even if you're thinking about it in a completely, yeah. you know, mundane sort of a way, you're thinking, oh, my gosh, I have to get divorced now. Who's going to get the house? Blah, blah, blah. But she's she's probably got that going on in her mind. But she's also got I just betrayed my husband who I yep. know attacked me and who I know is insane. This is bad. Yeah. Well, you notice Cooper doesn't bring that up either. No, he doesn't go like, oh, my God, I'm mean, like I've fallen for my partner's wife, my insane partner's wife. Well, yeah. <laughs> and he does say that I betrayed my best friend and have lost him to madness. And I think Cooper is sort of blaming himself a little bit for being right. the catalyst that made him crazy. But I think it was more that he, Wyndham orchestrated his own straw that broke his back. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. So I think that Cooper definitely should abs absolve himself of this. I mean, yeah, it's not cool to have sex with your buddy's wife. No, it's a bench. It be, that's a huge bro code violation there. But when your buddy is a murderous, insane man who's trying to kill both you and her, yeah, maybe maybe, I, maybe that's a like a uh, that's a pass on that one. 
I think it's time to start examining when loyalty <laughs> gets to be shown the door. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's like the moment you try to kill me or that you know the, your wife. Eh, yeah, maybe that's not the. Maybe mm-hmm. that's kind of where the bro code ends. I would think. Right. Should right. Be. So Coop. So Cooper's in the hospital recovering from the stab wound. Yeah. Wyndham is in the hospital recovering from being crazy after seeing what he saw. Right. Finally looks at Cooper, speaks to him and says, chess, anyone? Which yeah. means mm-hmm. Wyndham's ready to finish what he started. Game on. Well, yeah, because while he's being willed out, he essentially was laughing through all this. And he, he stops laughing as he's being willed out and says to Dale, your move. Creep. So, so picture like this whole like a, a whole Joker scene where like the Joker is is laughing away at Batman and stops laughing and says your move. Yeah, this is more of a scarecrow kind of a kind of yeah, but I agree. But kind of a game, yeah, yeah with the weird. But you see, but you see the, where I'm going with this. This that kind of yeah. psychotic this is, madman. This is this is the bastard psychotic love child of the scarecrow and the Riddler. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. You're right. I think yeah. the Riddler is a good comparison too. You're right. Um. So Dale gets discharged from the hospital, goes to visit Caroline's grave, and there's like a small stone of red granite that says, in memory. Who put it there? Well, you know, some people have their stones purchased before they're gone. That's so. Yeah, we don't know. You Uh, never know. So a month later, he asked Gordon for a leave of absence. So you know it must be real if he wants to leave the FBI. Yeah. Uh, He blames himself for his failure. And he basically spends the next six months beating himself up over it. His whereabouts are unknown. Nobody knows. I don't know who I am. We search and search and always end up looking into the same mirror at the same reflection, hoping that we will find something different, which I think is a, an interesting take on the concept of to repeat the same action and yeah. expect a, a yeah, this, different the, the reaction. Defin- the definition of madness is that you do the same thing expecting a different result. Right, and yeah. if you repeat the same action and expect a different reaction, is surely the sign of madness. Mm-hmm. And so, that's very true. That you know, we can't keep looking in the same mirror and seeing the same face and expecting something to be different. Right. It's just it's always going to be us, and you have to, as hard as it is, you have to own everything that you are, and the crazy parts, the good parts, the selfish parts, the nasty parts, the loving parts. Right. You have to own it all. Otherwise, you're going to keep trying to push it to the back, but it's still going to be there. It's still going to be, yep. you know, twist me and turn me and show me the elf. I looked in the <laughs> river and saw, I don't know what rhymes with elf. <laughs> so. Didn't know we were going to get this deep, did you, kids? Oh, yeah. This is welcome to. Yep. This is what happens here on Twin Peaks Out of Print Book Club. Yep. It gets very metaphysical. Yep. <laughs> um, that's right. So uh, we're deep diving big time here. All right. So this takes us to part six, the FBI year San Francisco, what I called. Um, mm-hmm. This is our last segment. And we have Dale. And th- by this time, it's February 1980. Right. And he's finally, it's hard for him. He doesn't, he says he doesn't want to believe it. He's not right. ready, but he knows it's true. Yeah. That. That's the same thing we've been saying for the last 20 minutes that this Wyndham Earl did this. Yeah. He was crazy for a long time before he even met Dale. Yeah. He doesn't know where and when he crossed the line. He knows that he, he knows orchestrated that, yeah. his own kidnapping. He kidnapped Caroline. He killed Caroline. And he's going to do all that he can to make sure that Wyndham never sets foot outside of the hospital. But right now, he can't prove it. He knows it, but he can't prove it. He doesn't right. want to believe it. He can't prove it, but he knows it in his heart. So he yeah. knows that he needs to. Yeah. He is. He has become the Doctor Loomis <laughs> to Wyndham Earl's um, Michael Myers in this situation. That he's just gonna. I spent seven years trying to reach him, and then another six trying to keep him locked up because I knew that what was living behind Wyndham's eyes was purely and simply evil. Yeah, it goes all Donald Pleasance. Yeah. Follows all Donald Pleasance on us. Yep. Uh, so Dale's ready to return to active status by this point. And about 10 days later, he records Wyndham in the psych ward. Mm-hmm. And he says, do you know who I am? Wyndham replies, yes, you are selling something. Where's Wyndham, Cooper asks. He left. 
So apparently we're Dale's talking to someone else, presumably. Yeah, so who are we talking to, I wonder? And what I think is funny is he's in a straight jacket. Right. And he says, my gloves don't have fingers, which yeah. is interesting in the sense that he has a straight jacket, which we all know your your arms go in right. and don't come out the other end. But thinking about also all those guys with their hands cut off. Yeah. So well, what is his deal with hands and fingers? Well, what, what I'm wondering is like, okay, we, we've kind of talked about like maybe that Bob has kind of – kind of – inserted himself into Wyndham like, on occasion. Mm-hmm. But, but what if Wyndham kind of went a little schizo, multiple, you know, dissociative identity disorder on us to try and hide from Bob. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. Or maybe is like his personality fragmented or something. A sort and, of a, yeah, which would be like, civil kind of a maybe thing. Maybe kind of a hide psych- from the mother had, had a psychotic break because of the experience. Maybe. And definitely a psychotic break. That's for sure. Yeah. So just something, just something I was wondering. Um, Cooper asks, where did he, where did Wyndham go? And Wyndham replies around here and there over hill over Dale. See what it, and of course, emphasizing the word Dale. And he says, Dale, I will hit the dusty trail. Which he does. Which yeah, because that's basically his code for like I'm gonna get out of here. I'm gonna bust out of here. Yep. Cooper asks, "Why did you kill Caroline? Was it because she loved me?" You know, I don't think I want to buy what you're selling. Yep. yep. And that's he says. Do you know who I am? Yes, you're selling something, and it's yep. That's the, he's, you call he's trying back. to sell he's trying to sell the idea that he knows what what Wyndham Earl is all about, and Wyndham right. Earl doesn't want right. to give in as as any more than Cooper wants to believe it. <laughs> So uh, Cooper asks, did you stab me? When Wintermore replies, define stab. (laughs) (laughs) It depends on what your definition of stab is. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Another 90s definition question that we all remember so well. Exactly. So he goes basically through the thesaurus of what it means to stab. Right. And And he he says, why? To heal all the sick little children of the world. Yep. And Cooper asks, where were you when you... Where were you taken when you were missing? And here's where we kind of get a, a little insight. Uh, Wyndham says, a rest stop with the biggest goddamn bathroom you've ever seen. Could that be a convenience store? That's what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. Like a highway convenience store? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what yeah, I'm and thinking. This, this is interesting to me, well, too. Well, because we, we know that it moves. For one thing, you do know that it moves and it can be, can be, can be one story, two story. We have no idea. Yeah. Maybe they didn't know this back in 91, but we know now. Know it now. Yeah. What does evil look like, Wyndham? You always ask the wrong questions. I don't think you've learned anything. Yep. So again, he's being told he asks the wrong questions. Well, here, well, yeah. And so, so here's the question then. Was the entity that Cooper's talking to here the same one that was inside the old man? Because he says, think, because he says, you always ask the wrong questions, and the only other time that phrase was brought up earlier in the book was the old man. I think exactly that because at the at, after their exchange, yeah. he says, "What did the old man teach you?" He says, "He taught me everything." Right. And I think Wyndham Earl yeah. wanted Cooper to go to that same island resort mm-hmm. so he could try and learn the same things, or at least meet the same evil entity he did, because. There's probably, just like Leland Palmer, there's probably still a little bit of Wyndham Earl in there that's tortured. Mm -hmm. And we all know Wyndham Earl's penchant for revenge. Right. And what better way to get revenge on someone but to subject them to the same torture you've been subjected to. Yeah. And and who says Bob couldn't have just been – like it wasn't just Laura and Leland that he was messing with. He could have been messing with a bunch of people for all we know. Well, and that's the th- I mean, and we obviously know there's weird stuff going on all over the world because right. here's Merle and Dale Cooper in Mexico, and then look what happened to Philip Jeffries in South America. Right. So this is not just a this is not just re- isolated into Washington State. Yeah, yeah. We essentially Bob is the personification of evil mm-hmm. that we understand. Right. Uh, right. And I think, and especially since when we read in the secret history of Twin Peaks. Right. about how there is this ancient evil in in the world and right. when you have and you you do have ancient ancient cultures from Mexico from South America that could have been aware of the same evil as well you know this this would be the kind of thing that 
the you might there might be a Twin Peaks story that we hear about some at some point from the ancient Celtic, right? You know, the Celtic spirits, things like that. I mean, when you have an age, it seems to go anywhere where there's an ancient ancient culture with right. the the native tribes here in North America, for, for, both in for all the we Pacific know. Northwest and in Mexico, and then the the native civilizations in South America. So this is an ancient evil. And you, that can, we're talking and about. you can apply it to anything. Like for all we know, Bob could have been Jack the Ripper. Well, that certainly you makes know. more sense than the H.H. H. Holmes theory. Right. Yeah. Have you heard that theory that H.H. No. H. Holmes was Jack the Ripper? No, I haven't heard that one. Well, it's an idiotic theory because it, t- first of all, doesn't take into account how long it takes to get from Chicago to London. Right. And there is no way in hell H.H. H. Holmes would have wasted bodies like that. Hmm. If anything, H.H. H. Holmes would have been the next um, Burke and Hare yeah. selling bodies. So I know way too much about H.H. H. Holmes. It's not good. It's not good. <laughs> not good. All right. So back to Twin Peaks. Back to Twin Peaks. So, uh, so Dale, and then I think rather wisely at this point, plays the tape for Gordon. And Gordon also agrees that he should never, ever leave the hospital, ever, right. ever, ever. Meaning Wyndham, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, meaning Wyndham. Yeah, and so Dale accepts reassignment to San Francisco at this point. This is... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Diane, pack your bags, we're going to San Francisco. Exactly. And the car is gassed up, the trailer <laughs> filled. I have a cooler full of sandwiches, pickles, marshmallows, trail mix, and milk. I love that. Yeah. And we should and have, he takes. We should he have had like, like Di- Diane him. saying "F you, Dale" or "F you, Cooper." Yeah, exactly. Where's the vodka? Yeah. I need vodka for going on this long of a trip. But yeah, he's taking his dad with him. Yeah. And they they do a little tour. Yeah, they go of to the, the United go, States as they, they go, go. They go to Re- and eventually land in Reno, where mm-hmm. his dad marries a woman named Shamrock. Shamrock, she's good luck. You, you gotta exactly. You gotta figure. She's lucky. He's gonna get lucky with Shamrock, apparently. Uh, so they get hitched. Uh, I think it, maybe his dad just kind of like um, leaves him at that point. You know, maybe he stays I, stays in Reno, or I don't know. I just I love the description of this. My new stepmother is named Shamrock. Interestingly enough, she is an old Bryn Mawr grad with a degree in Germanic languages. Right. They plan to spend their honeymoon in a little hut with a sauna on top of the Continental Divide. <laughs> Diane, do you ever wonder if you were left on your parents' doorstep by gypsies? Like, <laughs> he's like, how do I come from these people? Right. Yeah, pretty much. Um, well, of course, it's just it's kind of ironic, yes, that Cooper, the Mr. Straight-Laced FBI agent guy, had hippie parents, mm-hmm. apparently. Or at least well, a, and he, a hippie father, essentially, and brother. Well, right. That's the thing. Well, I mean, he's he's sort of the yeah, the odd. He's the basically yeah the. Uh, he's the black odd, odd, high he, He's the odd duckling. He definitely is, but uh, yeah, he's sort of the Alex P. Keaton of his family. Right. That everybody else is very, but he does share the yeah. that metaphysical psychic yeah. special gift thing with his mother. So he has that, but. Yeah. Although, yeah, his dad although is, instead of uh, you know Ronald Reagan on his wall, he has Cooper has J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover and Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. Yeah. yeah. So, and the, you know, with the dad, and I, you know, I'm sure that there are, I'm sure there's lots of dads out there who have lost wives and then yeah wound up inappropriately married to you know potters that cheat on them or well you know you have your midlife crisis and you are okay I'm going to get the twenty something and I'm forty and mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, exactly. That but so he gets to San Francisco after having some adventures throughout the United States, like going to Alcatraz, Great Plains, finding Chinese donuts. Yep. And guess who's in San Francisco with him? <laughs> so once again, the coincidences of Dale Cooper's life come right into the fore- forefront. Uh, yep. Robin Masters. Yeah, remember Robin? You know, from the, the FBI, from the FBI Academy, that he was kind of like having a little crush thing, but they never developed anything from it. Well, she's exactly. there in the San Fran office. And so he gets a new case about a month later, the body of a young man, approximately 20 dumped next to the highway, bound and gag shot several times naked with signs of sexual abuse. Poor guy. Now it that, feels to me that we have the makings of a serial killer. Yeah. Here. Cause there are apparently other unsolved murders. So yeah. So Mm-hmm. Um, and this is where it gets a little. And these are male prostitutes, right? 
So apparently this one was 19 years old, addicted to speed. Mm -hmm. And Cooper theorizes that the killer has killed eight times over the past two years in a straight line from Illinois to San Francisco. Mm. Six of the victims were last seen in gay bars. So Dale, and this is this is kind of hilarious. He goes undercover as a gay man, and he talks about yeah. how comfortable like leather. Ch he never knew how comfortable leather chaps could be, or whatever. The feel of leather against skin yes. is a surprisingly sensual experience, is what he says. Yeah. So he goes. So to, he goes. I to love the name of the club. It's club called y. Club Y. Yes. <laughs> as in Y. As in Y chromosome. Yes. Exactly. Um. So there's a light blue sedan circling the club. Dale pursues a Dodge Dart that attempted to run over a male prostitute after an argument over services rendered. My question about this Dodge Dart is, was there a chickadee on it? There was what? A chickadee. A chickadee. <laughs> nope, that's a chickadee on a Dodge Dart. <laughs> so what I, and what, another thing that I think is adorable yeah. about this is, says Club Y, Diane had yeah. been propositioned five times in the last hour. Not one fit the profile, though several were exceptional dancers. Yeah, so I must be doing a... something I didn't know when I was in college because I never had that kind of luck before. That's hilarious. <laughs> I just thought he's like, well, they're not what I'm looking for, but they're good dancers. Now, that, would so be, that would have been a hilarious Twin Peaks episode to see him undercover at a gay bar. That is so clinical. <laughs> Seriously. Um, so they end up like tracking down some evidence. They, the suspect was placed in custody, but that's not the serial killer, as it turns out. Mm -mm. The evidence points to a salesman named Bush. Dale captures the salesman who ends up confessing. Yes. And at this point, Dale's kind of fed up with the uh, whole um, violent crimes. So he has to be reassigned to the counterintelligence task force. And he stays right, there so, for stays there for the next six years. And they do not acknowledge if there are any tapes from this time period. The only thing that they have released or allow right. are audio letters he sent to his father. Yeah. And which some of these crack me up. Sorry to hear about Shamrock's accident. The lab people here at the bureau all agree that most people can function quite normally with only three toes. So <laughs> I don't know what happened here, but yeah. you know, she she lost some toes. Yep. Um, uh, so this takes us to 1987, the year I graduated high school. Nice. Yeah. Um, Dale's 33 by this point. Mm -hmm. He leaves counterintelligence to work on a jo joint drug interdiction program with the DEA. Okay. And there's a large shipment of cocaine being moved to a border town. The DEA is acting as a buyer in Tijuana, Mexico. Now Dale's DEA counterpart. A certain Dennis Bryson. Dennis Bryson. Where do where, I know somebody? Where do I know him? I know a Denise Bryson. I know a Denise Bryson. Yeah. So what I think is interesting about and he, this is And he kind of looks that, like Fox Mulder. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Huh. He's weird. familiar. Weird. What I think is interesting is that he, you know, this is this is good foreshadowing for yeah. when they have to track cocaine going across right. the, the northern border of the United States. It was, it was kind of nice to get some little bit of backstory about how... Cooper and Dennis Bryson know each other. Yes, I love that, and or, I, I love like, this because I knew, like he says, I in this show he says, like I knew you when you were Dennis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's a little thrown by all of a sudden she's Denise. Yes, exactly. I love, I love that he's uh, um, the one thing that never seems to change, regardless of country. As a traveler finds himself, is the lack of a view and accommodations that advertise one. The only vista I presently gauge out it is a large brown dog dragging a dead snake across a dusty road. I would not be surprised from the hook of the from the look of the dining room if I find that snake as a featured course of the midday meal. <laughs> next, the next entry is Diane. Never underestimate the truly unique eating experience reptile affords the adventurous palate. <laughs> so you know he's he's a little skeptical at first, but then he's like, hey, you know, snake isn't bad. Yep, yep. At least he's open to try things. Uh, so they get a call from the suppliers. Dennis decides to go with the seller, uh, which is, it turns out to be a big mistake, mm -hmm. ends up disappearing. Dale gets concerned, goes to Dennis's hotel room, retrieves an Israeli, retrieves Israeli hand grenades and a submachine gun from Dennis's suitcase. So mm -hmm. somehow he got that smuggled that into Mexico. Few things in this world are as persuasive as a hand grenade down the shorts. Yeah. 
So Cooper ends up tracking Dennis to a nearby ranch and then ends up rescuing him after lobbing some of those grenades. And he and Dennis end up like getting the hell out of Mexico. Pretty Yes. Because again, what is going on in Mexico? Right. So the next, I guess their next big case is uh, there's cocaine moving through a dentist's office in Oakland. Cooper mm-hmm. turns out we learn has a fear of dentists. Yes, he does. He had not been to the dentist in seven years. Yeah. He says, I'm sure this is just my imagination, but I am certain that every one of my teeth is suffering from severe decay. Yeah, Yeah, we make some comment that apparently that uh, like some uh, seven-year-old boy or whatever has a better dental future than I do or whatever. Yeah, the bad news is the eight-year-old I was seated next to in the waiting room has a better dental future than I do. He is the proud father of six cavities. Yeah. So, and, and he and says... then, Then he says, like, he makes the buy with the dentist and arrest him, but then he says, well, you know... Uh, but at least, you know, like I, he did nice work or something to that effect. I forget what it was. Each time he found a new cavity, the dental assistant would shake her finger at me. <laughs> Diane, if you have a moment, would you look through the Bureau's handbook and find out if there are any specific regulations against shooting dental hygienists? <laughs> <laughs> Diane, this is one dentist who has drilled his last tooth. Unfortunately, but, it was mine, but I think he did fine work. Yep. <laughs> so he was able to arrest the dentist. After he got, yeah, got some mm-hmm. uh, good dental work. Um, so I thought that was funny. Uh, so about a month later after that, he finally leaves the DEA FBI joint task force. Right. And presumably goes back to violent crimes again. Mm -hmm. Um, so in the beginning of 88, he receives a tape from Wyndham Earl who threatens him and says, he'll see him soon. Mm, I don't like the sound of that. Yeah. No. And, and here at this point, a couple like about a couple weeks later, Dale's assigned to a murder in southwest Washington. Now, that this sounds, is where this that book sounds gets weird. From, this sounds familiar. So he heads right. for a place called Deer Meadow. Yes, that Deer Meadow from Twin that... Peaks Firewalk with me. Mm-hmm. He meets up with Sheriff Cable. Yes, Sheriff Cable from again Firewalk with me. So that who, whole so that whole th- business. Go ahead. Who seems a little bit more agreeable? Yeah. In this. Yeah, he doesn't get quite get the resistance that Chet Desmond got. Right. Exactly. So basically, what's going on here is that this book. Yeah. Says that Dale Cooper investigated the murder of Teresa Banks, instead of Chet Desmond and. Yeah. Uh, Sam, which I think is bizarre. Because Fire Walk With Me. Well, first of all, this book, we, we talked about yeah. uh, in our last episode. I said pay attention to the date because right. this book was written before Fire Walk With Me came out. Right. So, and the first episode of Twin Peaks, when he is in the morgue looking at Laura Palmer's body, right. he says to Diane, he said, Diane, take this to Albert and his team. Don't go to Sam. Right. Albert seems to have more on the ball with this. So we know that Cooper knows that Sam has done this kind of stuff before. Right. And apparently this is our, this is our insight to the fact that even though Chet Desmond went missing, Sam came back. Yeah. So, you know, that was, that was incorporated into the movie. I'm just wondering why this wasn't. Well, from what I understand, Kyle McLaughlin was, they originally wrote the script for fire walk with me. Um, intending to have him, Kyle McLaughlin as Cooper in those Chet Desmond scenes. Mm-hmm. But apparently Kyle McLaughlin wanted a reduced role. He didn't want to do as much in Fire Walk With Me. Okay. So this at, this apparently is the reason why they created the character of Chet Desmond as a substitute Cooper, kind of like the War Doctor being um, a substitute Christopher Eccleston in... The no, Doctor, okay. Doctor Who 50th Anniversary Special, The Day of the Doctor, right. for all you Doctor Who geeks out there. The, um, the John Hurt Doctor. Yes, the John Hurt Doctor, yes, yes. because they originally wrote it um, intending for the you know, the original, in this case Co- uh, Cooper, to perform these this, this role. Um, and so this is why we find out here that the body's Teresa Banks, just like it was in Firewalk with me. 
And Cooper goes to the, see the body in the morgue, just like Chet Desmond did, only with Sam. And we don't it's get any. Much... We don't get any indication that Sam's with Cooper here. No, Cooper's by himself, right. and we get pretty much the same exact story. Yeah. Except there's no Carl Rod, there's no, no. Chalfont, there's none of that kind of stuff. But the whole, yeah, the same, the same thing about the yeah. She worked at a rest. He, she worked at a rest stop, which we know that she worked at. Um, you right, know. but we don't know that she was a prostitute. We we get the T. Yeah. Under we, her finger. Well, we kind of knew she. she we kind of knew she was a prostitute because of you know Leland was, made, was gonna hook up with her. Well, we don't know that in this book is what I'm saying. No, okay, I got you. They right. don't talk about that in the book. We don't find yeah. Flesh World in her apartment. That's true. That's true. We like don't that. have that connection. You're right. You're right. Right. We don't have that connection. And to bring it back to the real world yeah. again for a second, yeah. I think we have figured out why this book is out of point. Because they have decided that it, it's kind of – at least Because this, it is the, non-canonical. Well, at least this part is, yes. I, I think – now, yeah. essentially, the way I treat canon is that everything is canon until something more official comes along to contradict it. Well, and I think a movie directed by and, David Lynch yeah, is more official than this Exactly. Book. So in this case, Fire Walk With Me, the events in Fire Walk With Me, trump the events in this book. Agreed. So essentially, yeah, this is like, you know – alternate timeline hey you know maybe this is alternate timeline where cooper did this instead of chet desmond see see and i thought about that yeah. i thought about that that if that's how we can explain it at least and make it work right i right i was thinking about that that with with the whole wibbly wobbly tiny yep. wimey thing that right. happened in the last episode of the new series right that that might have done something but wouldn't that have only changed the ripples from when laura went missing yes it would have but it's, so what? Well, and, well unless, unless unless there's just more, maybe there was um, an alternate timeline where uh, Cooper went farther back. Possibly, maybe some. It, he did yeah. say, right. If we go further, everything will change. Right. So maybe that I you know yeah. I don't. This is this, <laughs> this is the this, this I, is the this is the part where your brain explodes. <laughs> My brain explodes. Yep. So. This is the part where we start pontificating on information that was written 25 years after yes. this book. And this book would have had no way of even beginning to predict what they would have said in this No, but, but, the, but we can kind of use our knowledge to kind of try to make it work a little right. bit. A little it, bit. Right. We can sort of try and it's fan not, fiction it. it exactly. It is kind of fan fiction-y, but, um, and, you know, but it does, it's kind of like – retroactively explaining what happened right right and it, it's just it I, i'd forgotten about this aspect of the book when i read this when i read this again for for a podcast right i was like oh yeah that's right there was no there there was no chet desmond there was no yeah. sam there was no yeah. there was none of that stuff with the local law enforcement yeah and there was no carl rod and right. so you know thank god we got carl rod oh yeah definitely that was definitely so, a, a upgrade that was a major, major upgrade. Yeah. So now we do. But get, I think. Go ahead. I, I I do think that this explains why the diary is still in print, but this book is not. Right. No, probably, probably. What they need to do is do a revised edition of this book, revised and updated version, to fit in with, <laughs> you know, with the you know kind of uh, fit it in that Chet Desmond did that. Maybe they could ex- use that as a way to explain what happened to Chet. Exactly, because we, we still don't know. So there you go. There's, a, there's, you know, update that, and we can finally find out what happened to Chet. Um, Come on, Mark Frost. You know you want to do this yeah, for us. Or Scott, get your brother on this. Who knows? Yeah, I don't care which member of the Scott get, family or the, the on, Frost family does this. I'm, I, it just, I would like, I would like for it to happen. Bring in another Frost, Fred Frost. You know, Dave, how many Frost Dave, you got? I'll Dave, take them all. Dave Frost. Who knows? Uh, now we do get a little bit more information on Teresa Banks, which I kind of liked. I liked this too. So yeah, we find out that she was born in Tacoma, Washington in 1972, Ellen and Tony Banks. So we know her parents. And at 12, we find out her parents were killed in a car accident and she became a ward of the state. Poor kid. And then about three years later, she runs away from a state facility. And presumably there's the gap where between there and she ends up becoming a prostitute. Well, Deer, unfortunately, Deer she probably becomes a prostitute 
around the same time she runs away. Probably. So she's probably had a very hard track in order life. To, in order to survive. Yeah, she probably did. It, right, right. That's exactly what I'm thinking. Um, but yeah, we do learn a little bit more about her backstory. She becomes a little less yeah. mysterious, but and in a sad moment, she she ends up getting buried in an unmarked grave. I know. I hate that she's in in but, but Potter's it, Field it, like but that. It, but it makes sense. It does make sense. It yeah. does. It just it's given it's who she was. Such, she's just such a tragic person. Yeah. Uh, well, Twin Peaks is nothing but tragedy in a lot of ways. Um, but Cooper's Cooper's there at least. Uh, he ends up returning to San Francisco because hey, there's no leads to follow. Yeah, there's nothing, and and there's not going to be because this is. Yeah. We find out later this is like a completely supernatural thing that he won't even begin to come close to right. until he gets to Twin Peaks. Right. And and the only reason Bob was even there was because Leland was there. Right. So it makes you wonder how many other prostitutes there were in Leland's business trips across right. wherever he went that we just haven't noticed yet because we've only we found an R right. and a T and a B, right? Right. Now Robert's granted, got more letters. <laughs> now granted well, yeah, exactly. Well, so maybe it was just either that was just the third in a potential series of victims that never happened. Or he Or there are just victims we never found out about. That's what I'm wondering, that if he ever did finally finish spelling his name, we just don't know who they are. Right. It's a good, it's a good question. Uh, Cooper, a month later, has dreams of a dancing of dancing with a little man and a beautiful young woman. Well, Ooh, gee, who could those people be? Who could be? those be? But yeah, you know, a little timey wimey action going on here. When you see me again, it will not be me. Right. Yep. Doesn't she look almost exactly like Laura Palmer? She is Laura Palmer. I feel like I know her, but yep. sometimes my arms bend back. Yep. So we've got more yep. uh, tapes coming in from... Right. Winnemarole, like in June of 88, uh, Winnem attempts to escape but gets caught. What I think is interesting about this letter from Wyndham Earl yeah. is he says, met any nice girls lately? Right. Which makes me wonder if... They were going, they were thinking of saying that Wyndham Earl had something to do with Teresa Banks. Yeah. But I'm glad they didn't go through that. Yeah. Well, I think it's just, yeah. Yeah, we don't know. because it, Or maybe he's just pouring salt in the wound of the fact I, that he knows that Caroline was the love of his life. That's what I kind of got thinking that, like, who maybe he's, maybe it's kind of a veiled threat of, like, whoever um, Cooper hooks up with in the future, Wyndham, Wyndham Earl's going to kill her. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm thinking. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Wyndham Earl says in a tape that it's time for the game to commence. Wyndham will move first at the worst possible time, but doesn't quite move just yet. Well, and we know that Wyndham does move at the worst possible yeah. time when Cooper is has been put on leave from the FBI for breaking right. the law to go into Canada to get Audrey. So after that happens, that's when that's when he makes his move. When Cooper legally can't do anything right. because he's he's on leave from the bureau, he's had to turn in his badge. Yeah. So we know he does in fact do that. Yeah. Now, at this point, after getting this tape from Wyndham Earl, somehow Dale gets it in his head that, hey, I'm going to ask Diane out to dinner. When I read this, I thought, is this the dinner? Is this the night? But no, but, it would, no, no, it couldn't be. No, because she, because, because there are some things that happen before he does wind up leaving for, right. for Washington. But yeah, she talks about how, she talks about the food that they ate in a very sensual manner. Yeah, they ate at a Chinese restaurant. So he took her to there. Um, and this is where he doesn't realize, he realizes that he doesn't know her last name. You would, think, right. you would think she would have a nameplate on her desk. Or that he would have to, I don't know, sign something with yes. her name on it. Yeah, or, 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 yeah, or there'd be like a copied like a, a copied memo to her that would have her name on it. You would think. Something. Yeah, something. But apparently not. No, apparently that Dell doesn't really sweat the small details when it comes to women, apparently. Uh, he's told that he needs some vacation time again. 
So Andy, Which I think is funny that he just really doesn't want to go. Yeah. He's just content. Yeah, he says he's, so like he's, he's like some he's like some little man in a in a small office or whatever. Some he's, little man in front of a computer has yeah. decided to take a vacation. Right. But the thing is, it, it, when you have been spending most of your life since you were what like twelve years old, right, trying to achieve what he's currently doing, you probably do think that the vacation is not worth it. Yeah, it's just like I want to work or whatever. I wanna, right, I want to do the, be an agent. Um, so he ends up going to Medicine Hat, Alberta in Canada. He's hoping really good pie there, apparently, apparently. And he's hoping to find his brother while he's in Canada only to find out his brother is now in South America. Yeah. So he says, you know, they haven't talked to in about 20 years Yep. and he wishes they weren't strangers, but they, they have very different paths and he's aware of that. They keep missing each other, and that's kind of the last we learn about Dale's brother Emmett. Right, we never hear from we never hear about him again. No, we don't know what happened to him. Um, so a couple months later, Dale heads to Philadelphia after learning his father is ill. Mm-hmm. So presumably, presumably, this is the point where um, in Philadelphia, where Philip Jeffries shows up during this time while he's there, right? Well, what year is it? Well, this is this right here is 1988. That would make sense. Yeah, yeah that would make sense. That would be the, around the same time. Yep. So apparently for Cooper, you can never go home again because yeah. Yeah, this is September, the hardware store, September of 88. Yeah, the hardware store is gone. Mm-hmm. His house is now a parking lot. <laughs> yeah, they put it down uh, for a parking lot for a fried chicken restaurant. <laughs> the Schlermans yep. are gone. The school is still there. Um, and apparently the janitor that caught him recording the sex education class right. won $50,000 in Atlantic City and has retired, <laughs> which I think is awesome. Mr. Jackpots. So, Mr. Jackpots. So, yeah, so the, you know, the movie theater was, yep. was on fire. The diners closed. And the yeah. only thing he says that remains the same is the cemetery. Yeah. You can't go home again. But apparently you can shop there. Yes. Yes. So, um, good news though, Dale's father recovers. He had a felt, faulty valve in his heart and he and Shamrock decide they're going to sell the printing shop and leave Philadelphia. Right. And the printing shop, which we found out a while back had a bit of a reprieve after he sold all of those lunar maps to national geographic. Right. So he had a bit of a windfall there and then yeah. he started making, he started making calendars. Maybe that got him to like to get his business back up and running. Again. Right, and he started. You know how when you get him out of bankruptcy. Yeah, you know yeah. how like when you get a Christmas card from your insurance agent, it has a little calendar in it or something like that. Yes. That's I think what his. I think he mentioned something about his father printing calendars after that. So I think he was printing calendars for other local businesses and things like that. Obviously, something people need every year. Right. So, and here is um, where Cooper tells Diane that his father was in fact the one that discovered Cooper's crater. Right. Which again is adorable. Yep. So you really love that. I love that. I love it when you take a, an existing factual historical fact yep. and then make a story around it. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes yep. it's not that great, but I think it's an interesting way of telling a story. Um, for example, there was a British miniseries a couple of years ago called Titanic. Yes. And, um, yeah, what's her name was in it? What was the, the, the companion from Dr. Who, who started out as the robot that couldn't make custard. Oh, well, yeah, no, well she wasn't a robot. She was, you mean, uh, Jenna Coleman, Jenna Coleman. Yes. Yeah, Jenna yeah, Coleman yeah, was, yeah. She played, um, well, first she played, yeah. Um, yeah, she wasn't the, a robot, but she was like the, a, no, was she, well, we find out that in the course of the story that she, was um ended up becoming a dalek that yes yes the dalek. yeah because yeah because um the uh clara oswald his eventual companion clara, thank you yeah, I could so, not think of her name. so clara oswald so eventually she gets fragmented th- and scattered throughout time and one mm-hmm. of those cells oswin oswald ends up on this getting on this ship and um is essentially converted to a dalek that we find out through the course of the story, and this is before he actually meets her as Clara, 
later on. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So, yeah. So that was Jenna Coleman. Jenna Coleman, yeah. So Jenna Coleman is in it. and Who I've met, by what... the way. Oh, is she lovely? She is very lovely. And, nice. Yeah, yeah, just as pretty as you would think in, in person. So, oh, I'm sure they. I'm sure she is. Yeah. So they. So in this mini series, one of the things that the mini series, <laughs> and Chris and I like to jokingly say this, they, um, as paraphrasing, um, the Royal Tenenbaums. Yes. What this show presupposes <laughs> is that <laughs> Peter Peter the painter. Yep. Was on the Titanic. Okay. Which is you know peter the painter being the famous anarchist who would leave his mark through graffiti and no one knew who he was that was just his name through the press and law enforcement that he went on the titanic because around the same time all activity that had been attributed to him the mo that had been attributed to him stopped so that conjecture was that he was on the titanic and went down with it so that's why everything stopped and i think that's I think that's an interesting storytelling device. Whereas the James Cameron Titanic, I think, takes that a little too far. Well, the Cameron version is so romanticized. Well, the Cameron version is so, you know, it it does take an existing historical event and riffs on it, which I think is a fine idea. But I think it zelligs itself a little bit too much. And I apologize for using a reference that (laughs) validates the work of Woody Allen but if you've ever seen the movie Zelig, basically he's in every possible historic thing. I guess you could say Forrest Gumping. Yes. Where? Um, well, you weren't validating it. You were just referring to it. I was referring to it. Well, the, well, the thing was is that when Forrest Gump came out, we said it, he was he was Zelliging. Yes. <laughs> so Got now it. we should say he's Forrest Gumping. You made a verb so, out of it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So the, the the story sort of Forrest Gump's the character of Rose a little bit too much, but I like that concept, and I like that concept in this too that. You know, his name's Cooper, the creator's Cooper, and they just they just slide it in there. It clicks. Subtly. It clicks. I think that's I think that's adorable. That is adorable. So. Um all right, so a couple months later, Dale realizes he's bored. I need a case. A good case. Mm-hmm. And, and guess what? He gets one. Of February twenty fourth at six in the morning. Yep. There's been a body found in Washington State. Yep. A young woman wrapped in plastic. She's dead, wrapped in plastic. Get Harry on the horn. Yep. So yes, that is our last, yep. our last after yep. one final letter. Yep. from Wyndham Earl. He wants one last game. One last game, but yep. of course Cooper He's, leaves for Washington. Yeah, and he it's... says like, "Oh, I'll make my first move very soon." Well, you said that back like a year ago, and you still haven't moved yet. Well, again, how long did it take to count of Monte Cristo? Seven years. Yep. Yep. So. So yes, the last entry yeah. is um, is Cooper going to Twin yeah. Peaks. Yeah, that's February 24th. Now, four days before, though, I thought well, this was kind of interesting. He's unable to sleep, and he's questioning why he's here at this moment. And he, mm-hmm. he asks, what, what is he destined to intersect with? So they try to ex- reveal at least that Dale was a little prescient, that something was going to happen. Right. So, and then yeah. then four days later, he goes to right. he goes to Twin Peaks. But I, and I and I love him saying, Diane, yeah. as Groucho Marx once said, Harpo, you talk too much. <laughs> yeah. That's so good, I think that's his, that that's his way yeah. of saying I'm possibly overthinking this. Yes. Yeah. But but obviously not, because something was about to happen. Yeah. And for those of you kids out there who don't know the Marx Brothers. <gasps> Shame on you. Shame on you, first of all, especially yeah. now that we have this thing called the Internet and YouTube and you can look them up all the time. Right. Harpo never spoke. Right. Harpo actually had a honk that was, honk. That, that, was, that was his character was that he was a mute that used a horn to communicate. Yes, he used a horn to communicate. So he was the he was the um, the teller of yes. the Marx Brothers. Right. <laughs> so that's why that joke is funny. Yeah, it is. Um, now, there was one kind of continuity glitch here. One? Well, there's a few, but the big one, I think, is when um, Caroline stated to have died in 1979. Mm-hmm. But in the show, Cooper said she died four years ago, which would put the murder about 1985. Yeah, that is a little weird. That's like six years difference there. So kind of a, yeah. A little... mm-hmm. And that's, and and that's and again, not I something. Think, I think that this timeline was shifted. 
to account well, to accommodate the writer or what the writer wanted to write about. Right, and I and I think in the sense of this, in the realm of just this this book, right, that is a bit more of an egregious uh, continuity issue because that's something that was existing at the time, as opposed to the changes they had to make for Fire Walk with Me to be Chet Desmond investigating the Teresa Banks crime rather than than Cooper. And I will say I prefer the Chet Desmond storyline because as I said before, we get Carl Rod. Right. And it just makes the story that much more mysterious. Right, because you have um an FBI agent that just suddenly disappears, which is why Cooper's kind of brought in to kind of pick up where Chet leaves off. Right. And you have the connection to Flesh World and Leland Palmer and right. to Laura Palmer. And we didn't have that at the time. We only knew that the FBI was specifically Cooper was there right? because he was aware of the previous case. They never said in the show that he was on the previous case. He was just aware of it. Right. And him being on, and this is something we of course work in later that him being on the Blue Rose Task Force yeah. would make him aware of it, regardless of whether or not he was on the case personally. Yeah, we don't get anything like associating with the Blue Rose, though, at this point. But, no, the Blue Rose is... So that must have been something that they invented for Twin Peaks Fire Walk With Me after this book was written. That was completely generated for, for Fire Walk With Me. Yeah. We've never seen that before yeah. or since. And, and interestingly enough, Blue Rose was only that one thing we haven't necessarily seen a blue rose no but we've had you know a reference to it right we've had reference and they are called the blue rose task force because of that one case the i am the blue rose right and the tulpa but we've never seen laura with a blue rose we've no. never we've never seen an actual well, blue rose well, come no, up no we did no we did because remember there was that whole thing that um Miriam in the hospital was sent a bouquet of flowers of blue roses. Oh yeah, that's true. There was that's that. true. But but never with Laura though. No. So um there's this is an intricate intricate world of strange and beautiful yep. terrifying things. Wonderful and strange. Wonderful and strange. Yep. So do you have a rating for all this? Oh, for this book, yes. Yeah. We should rate this book. I am going to give this book 7 out of 10 fireworks. Okay. Um, simply losing points, I think, for... I, I would have liked to have seen more of how Dale Cooper handles cases. Right. And I think that by the the redactions, while logical, I would have liked to have read more. Right. Um, and of course, losing a point for being only half valid at this point. <laughs> yeah. And um, um, losing a point just because I would like some good things for Cooper. <laughs> because we know that after... You know, he has some nice times in Twin Peaks... But it, it he has some rough his his entire life has been kind of rough and that saddens me. Yep. Does it make it a bad book? No. I'm not. This is not my quality rating. Right. This is my enjoyment rating. So. Okay. Well, I give this one. I'm a little more generous. I give it eight out of ten cassette tapes. Nice. Thank you. Um. I, I mean, I, I I treated this book as like, okay, it was a product of its time because obviously it came up before Fire Walk with me, before right. season, season three. So, oh, yes. so, yes. Um, so yeah, there's going to be some inconsistencies. I, I was expected that. I like Scott Frost's writing of Cooper. I think he, he, um, I think he really captured Kyle MacLachlan's voice as Cooper. I think Scott Frost did a fantastic job capturing Cooper. Yeah. Most His, definitely. Yeah. I mean, just. The, his his phrasing of things, um, you know, just the way he um, kind of like you could almost hear Kyle MacLachlan reading this dialogue. 
And so, oh, yes. so, so yes, I appreciate sure it. Can. And we learned a lot of stuff about Cooper, his life and, you know, just granted. Yes. I would have liked to have gotten a lot of that stuff, redacted stuff. Yeah. Um, I think that would have been more interesting if we had kind of had an expansion of the, the FBI years mm-hmm. and, may, and maybe I would sacrifice some of the earlier stuff, but um, I find it really interesting. And, you know, just that, the this this kind of like wacky you know his doomed relationships throughout his life and right. now, and, and now I, and now that we know about the white knight syndrome yeah i think it kind of puts everything in context for me so i kind of like that it definitely puts things into perspective and puts things into context and does explain a lot about cooper yeah i just didn't want that for him right and like i said this is this is my I mean, if we're judging, if we're judging this on that's quality fair. of writing, this is definitely a nine out of ten. But when it comes to my enjoyment, right? That's where that's where my reading comes from. That's, that's my that's, reading of enjoyment, not my my judgment of quality. That's fair. That's fair. Um, so we did get some feedback on our Facebook. We didn't get uh, have time for this last time, so I want to get this in. Oh, fantastic! Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Rachel O'Rourke Williams. Uh, DM'd us on the Facebook page, Ghost with the Twin Peaks podcast. Uh, she writes in, says, thank you for the in-depth discussion of the final dossier. I'm a bit behind on the podcast, and I just listened to those two episodes. That's cool. You're not that far behind. That's cool. You're good. Uh, you know, take it at your leisure. Savor um, it. Exactly. We're not out. We're not, <laughs> we don't do this weekly. Well, we did kind of the past two weeks we did it weekly, but generally we don't. So that's okay. Um, so here's something I've been thinking about. If Lo- Laura is only missing, then her cousin is still alive. Oh. And, and so is Harold, come to think of it. <gasps> Please. I would love that. So Maddie Minnett lived in Missoula. Isn't there another connection to Missoula? Question mark. What do you guys think? Well, yes. Well, there's an actual physical connection to Missoula because that is where David Lynch grew up. Yeah, that was his birthplace. Yes. So, yeah. And and then, of course, we had that mention in um, episode 14, the seventh episode of the second season, Lonely Souls, where Leland tells Maddie, you're going back to Missoula, Montana. Montana! Yep, as he rammed her head into a glass painting frame. Oh my god, that is such a disturbing moment. Now here's the here's the really Easter egg moment moment. In that frame, that painting frame, if you look in the lower corner, you can see the words Missoula, Montana written in nice. the on the yeah, so mm-hmm. so he's like, Okay, this is where you and that kind of explains why he said those words. Literally and figuratively you're going yeah. back in there. Yeah, so but um but yeah, yeah, if it if Laura being taken out of time yeah, presumably, I mean, we don't know if maybe Bob went after um, Maddie, but there would be no reason if Laura was taken out of time like that. Because there would be no reason for Maddie to right. come stay for that long. Exactly. She would just have, there would be have no remained reason in, to, in Montana. Right, and there would be no reason to mess around with Maddie and make people think that she's Laura. Yep. And so that's, yeah, that's interesting. So. This Rachel, this is an interesting path we have gone down here. Right. So if if Laura never dis well, if Laura is alive but just disappears, yeah, then I'm presuming a lot of similar things would have happened, like James kind of needing to get away and find his head, and right, um, and I and I think that. But no, okay, okay. Now I'm I'm sort of talking as I'm thinking, and that's never <laughs> yeah, a good thing, right? So if Laura goes missing, maybe you have to talk this out. We have to talk this out. If Laura goes missing, yep, domino effect here. Would the same actions be taken by the same people? For example, would Maddie still come? Now I'm thinking. Now, now that I think about it, Maddie might not still come because if you have. If your daughter goes missing, maybe what you don't want is another girl in the house to remind you that your daughter's missing. So maybe that would have been a little more inappropriate. Right. So maybe she wouldn't have come and stayed for as long. Right. Um, would well, there wouldn't have been a funeral for one thing. There would have been. A, there would not have been a funeral. That's true. But she does stay with them for a while to sort of help take care of things. So you're right. Yeah. So maybe maybe she did maybe, come to help out for a little bit. 
Right. I'm wondering if she would have come to help out a little bit or if that would have just felt weird to, you know, be like she was, Mm -hmm. you know, replacing. I don't know. I'm not sure. It depends on who you are. It's possible. I would say it's possible at least that she. Yeah. But would, would Donna have been as eager to solve the mystery and find Laura? So, because you would think that if she went missing, the cops would still have gone through her room and found the safety deposit box with the other diary. And then they would have found out about Harold. So would they have still gone to talk to Harold, but maybe Harold would be a little less freaked out because Laura was just missing, not dead. Right. And I think, I think Um, that as far as Donna, I think that she wouldn't have been, I think I think the fact that that Laura died it obviously upset her because you know she she cried when she learned that realized that right. Donna was dead in that homeroom scene. Mhm. So um if she thought that dead maybe just like she's out there somewhere we don't know that she's dead because there hasn't been a body found. So there's exactly. maybe that little glimmer of hope that she's still alive. Right, but would she still have gone to Harold to try and find out what Harold knew about her and if she had told Harold where she was going yeah. or something? Or would they have suspected Harold? And then would Harold have maybe been yeah, well, that's, the, 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 the put investig- in the holding cell and hanged himself in jail? I mean, would something bad have still happened to Harold? Well, the investigation would have shifted, obviously, from a murder to a missing persons case. Right. And again, when you have a missing persons case like that, again, we yeah. have everybody's suspect. Right. So I'm just I'm just wondering how people's actions would have been different. I mean, I still think that Donna would have thought that being Laura's best friend, she's the only one that can solve this crime, especially maybe even more so because now that Laura's just missing, mm-hmm. you know, was Laura kidnapped or did she run off on her own? And therefore, Donna might think I'm the only one that would know because I knew her better than she thought I did. Right. My, so see. I don't I honestly don't know. I'm wonder, I'm wondering if the FBI would have been called in because if um maybe Ronette never got you know crawled down off the mountain out of that train car and cr- See that was that's another thing that's a good point because the reason that, that was the reason they gave is that once Ronette crawled you know crawled across that bridge Right since Ronette was technically in Canada Yeah that became a federal crime It became a federal thing so right. if jurisdiction if at that, least if that night was just Leo and Jacques and Ronette up at the cabin right. with Leland with no reason to go there, yeah. would Ronette have been, you know, I don't want to say okay, right. but would Ronette have been, she wouldn't have been taken by Leland to the train car. Yeah. And if it was just a missing persons case, they wouldn't have called the FBI in for a missing person. Not at not, that point, I don't think. Yeah, not. I mean, not unless there was some kind of evidence that there was. They may, they may have. Well, okay. Here's the thing. Yeah. If they had found out once, once they opened the safe deposit box uh, and found and found Flesh World, right, and realized that and the cocaine and cocaine and realized that Leo Johnson was transporting cocaine mm. across state lines, and engaging in teenage prostitution across state lines then they might have called in the fbi with that but i think it would have been later on that they would have done that well you this really goes down a rabbit hole doesn't it this goes down a great rabbit hole yeah i mean yeah, I, 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 you, write, you, you can write an entire you, yeah you can write an entire book on this depending on seriously how. <laughs> yeah because what you know what are hmm. what are the actions and maybe i need to write this book i think you do yeah, what are the what are the what are the actions that people take and the subsequent reactions based on Laura missing rather than Laura being dead? Right. It sets so. up a whole different chain of events. And you know, the FBI may have I, I'm sure the FBI definitely would have come in once they figured out about one eyed jacks, because that is across the border. Yep. And that is gambling, prostitution. Right. So that would be an across the border if, federal. If the co- yeah, if the cocaine led all the way to the yeah, what the drugs being mealed across the border. Yes. Then, yeah, then so that yes, very the FBI would have been called in. So yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. All right, just maybe things would have played out, but they just would have played out differently. I would really, really like to think that Howard would have stayed alive. Yeah, I really love Howard. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, hope you got. Uh, oh, not Howard. Harold. 
Harold. Yeah, Harold, yes. What's wrong with me? Yeah. What's wrong with my brain it's, tonight? It's my dad's name. Come on. Uh, <laughs> so, you should stay alive, too. <laughs> yes, you should. Yes, you should. Uh, especially since tomorrow's his birthday. That's right. Yeah. He'll be, birthday he'll be 83. Uh, tomorrow is uh, my cousin Kelly's birthday as well. Oh, happy birthday. She'll be 34? Okay. 35? I forget. 34, I think. Okay. All right. So uh, that, now you know our birthday information. So I hope you weren't getting too personal there. Yes. I don't. We, we don't want to get too personal. <laughs> don't want to get too personal. Um, so thanks, Rachel. I hope you got your money's worth out of that uh, that answer for that from your question so seriously yeah we can we can yeah, we, yeah, I, we I, can I, we could just do, like take this as far as it could go we could do this another two hours just... i could probably i'll probably be marrying marinating on this for the yes. next couple of weeks so <laughs> this will probably come back up again that's true yeah definitely that's true because yeah yeah you got so you're gonna have some time to kill on that flight yes that's true yeah. that's true i have an eight hour flight coming up next week yeah. i'm going to valencia spain ah yes so. It's a little you got to brush up on your espanol. Brush up on my espanol, which is not that great, but I can get around. I can, I can go to the store and you I can, can buy bus tickets. You can so get by. Yes, I can get by. Donde esta casa de Pepe? <laughs> <laughs> Donde esta la zapateria? Where is the shoe store? <laughs> I, just, I just thought of that old Steve Martin album that made me think of it. Uh huh. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, uh, so yeah, maybe a little while before we do another Ghostwood, maybe a few weeks, presumably. Possibly, yes. So, what do you want to talk about next time? You know, I don't know. Let's 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 marinate on that and surprise everybody. Okay, because I was thinking this got me because going through this got me thinking about the Diane Twin Peaks tapes of Agent Cooper. Oh yeah, we could do yeah, that, which true. is also by Scott Frost, unless, or unless also you unless Frost. you want to yeah. do something a little different to kind of break up the thing, break up the uh, Cooper emphasis. No, we could do that. We could do that because there there is on on those that cassette there is a lot of new material. Sound, there's there's, sound, there's the, sound bites the show. Yeah. There, so what what what's on those tapes for those who aren't aware? They did like some some of the tape recordings that Cooper did while he was on the show, but there's also some specially recorded new material that, yes. that Kyle McLaughlin did. So we get a little yeah, bit let's... more bonus stuff. So we could talk about that. Let's do that. Let's do. Let's finish out the Cooper stuff. I forgot about those. Yeah. yeah let's... Okay. So next time, well, like uh, so for was it here? Next time for episode thirty. Episode hit, thirty. We hit the big three zero. Good for us. Yeah. So uh, so we'll do that here in a few weeks after Zan gets back from Spain. Yep. As she comes back, back all tanned and rested. Well, I've been looking at the weather report, and it's going to be kind of overcast and rainy, so I uh, doubt it. Uh, It'll be nice weather. It'll be like in the 60s. but well, That's not bad. It's been, yeah. Better, well, it's better than some of the weather we've had here lately. So Right? Yeah. Jeez. So, all right. So, uh, so come on back. Um, in the meantime, if you want to get a hold of us like Rachel did, so thank you again for writing in, Rachel. And a great question. And if you want to reach us like Rachel did, you can reach us on the Facebook page, Twin uh, Ghostwood the Twin Peaks Podcast. Or you can reach us on the Twitter machine, at GhostwoodCast. Please do there and follow us. That would be great. Or you can email us, do the old school email, at GhostwoodPodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and if you got any questions, just something you maybe your theories on the alternate timeline ramifications. We'd love to hear from you. Please let us know. Or yeah, if you got any ideas of stuff that you'd like to have us cover here on Ghostwood, we're up for that as well. Stuff we haven't already covered, that would be great. Uh, Zan, where can they reach you on the interwebs? Well, uh, after you get back from uh, your vacation, or at least well, hopefully, hopefully I'll have some internet access while I'm there, but we'll see. Yeah. Um, you're on vacation. You're not supposed to. I try to stay away from the computer when I'm on vacation. I would hope so. Yeah. Um, I'm plug, I'm plug a little bit. Yes, I am on the Facebook as Zan Sprouse. Yes. Um, I am one of the moderators of the Ghostwood page. So if you have anything yes. specific for me, I'm there for that. Yep. Uh, I'm on the Twitters. Yeah. And on the Instagrams as Udinax19, where I just basically post goofy little. 
<laughs> ramblings about my life or photos of things I think are hilarious. So, and they're uh, I- they're awesome. Or you, or you, or you send me uh, valentines from Leo Johnson. Yes, yes, <laughs> Leo Johnson valentines. Yes, it, for uh, for for um, times for 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 a bit of a time calibration here. Today is the fifteenth uh, of February, the day after Valentine's Day, and. Right. I found some funny little valentines on um, on the interwebs, and one of them was a picture of Leo that was basically his rambling about, you smoke one brand of cigarettes from now on, because if I come home and find two brands of cigarettes. Yep. <laughs> so it was, and it was, manif- it was made to look like a valentine, which I think is horribly psychotic. <laughs> and then, and, there and was then of course, they had the picture of him um, when he's got the, the sunglasses on, the party hat. And the mm-hmm. and the kind of kazoo in his mouth and yeah, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. Oh my God, Bobby, he moved. Yep. And then there was another one that I saw that I thought was uh, quite funny and a little bit naughty. It Ooh. said uh, it was Pete Martell, and it said, "This Valentine's Day, let me put my fish in your percolator." Ooh, hey now! Oh my goodness, we're getting a little forward there, aren't yep. we? A little uh, risque there from a little uh, bit risque. Pete, Pete Martell, who knew he had it in him. I think he just seemed like such a sweet old man. He did seem like such a sweet old man. That's true. Yep. So, so Charles, it's, it's, always, so it's always the quiet ones. Uh, oh, of course, funny. you can reach me on the interwebs at Charles Skaggs on the Twitter machine, at Charles Skaggs on the Instagram, Google Plus for all you crazy kids on the Google Plus, my, and then uh, Facebook, of course, at Charles Skaggs, and my blog of geeky things. Damn good coffee and hot. Damn good coffee and hot. Where I talk about all the things Twin Peaks ish and Ghostwood and all kinds of comic books, sci fi goodness uh, on my blog. Lots of stuff coming out this week. Um, so, you know, a bunch of trailers that came out recently and a bunch of some TV news, movie news. So check that out. You're um, just nerding it up over there, aren't you? Pretty much. You're, what are you saying? That I have no life? No. No, I'm just that's, saying you're nerding it up. <laughs> I'm geeking. That's, that's your life. It's I, pre- it I prefer geeking it up because nerd is always. I've always treated nerd as a slur. Really, it's the interesting. E- the uh, the n word, a different n word. See, I always thought of I always thought of nerd as being a little more bookish, and geek as being a little more fanish. Yeah. So, or as they I, say in The Simpsons, I'm not a nerd, Bart. Nerds are smart. <laughs> 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 Poor Millhouse. I think it's kind of funny that you did something rather nerdy by re- referencing The Simpsons at that point. <laughs> I can't not do something nerdy or geeky. That's just what I do. But that's why we love you so much. Aww. Aww. I love you. No, oh, I love you too. All right. So uh, now that we've done this mutual love fest, um, everybody come on back for episode 30. We'll talk Diane, the Twin Peaks tapes of Agent Cooper. And uh, we'll do a little bit more insight into the weird and wonderful brain of Dale Bartholomew Cooper. Dale Bartholomew Cooper Cooper and the weird brain of the Frost family and the Lynch family and everybody in between. And we'll get to listen to some Kyle McLaughlin goodness as well. That is always awesome. And, um, you know, while you're while you're waiting for episode 30. Yep. Head on over to the Southgate Media Group Patreon. See what you see. Yep. You know, get an idea of what else is going on in the podcast world of Southgate yeah. Media. Maybe, yeah. you know, every month you want to give us a buck or two. Yep. That'd be great. That would. And then maybe you could check out some podcasts like, oh, I don't know, Next Stop Everywhere or the Phantom Zone podcast or the upcoming Titan Talk, the Titans podcast. I hear those would that, be good ones to pick. I've heard those are great podcasts. They've got a really good host. Well, the, the yeah, well, yeah, the, let's see. One's Jesse Jackson. He's really good. <laughs> and another one's Karen Lindsay. She's good. So Jesse and Karen are very good. Yeah. I, I don't good. know about the other guy. The other guy kind of sucks, but yeah. You know. Oh, what are you talking about? But anyway. So. But uh, yeah. So and also this time around, the tapes of Dale Cooper, I believe, are on Audible. Yes, they are. They yes. are. They are so, on Audible. Um, they might be on YouTube too. Okay, if but yes, would, they are a little more available than the. Yeah, uh, you get probably a better quality if you go through Audible. Yeah. Yes, and if you already or belong you, to Audible, or and you're like, you, "Oh man, what am I going to get this month?" Well, that's what you can get. Or if you're like me, you can dust off your old cassette player and 
uh, yeah, and your the actual cassette that you still own, and hope that it doesn't like jam when you play it. Oh, but doesn't get eaten. Yeah, yes. that's that's where I'm at. That's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to have to uh, crack up, crack open the old alcohol bottle and cotton swab, and do a little head cleaning little, before yeah, I do that. A little maintenance might not yes, be a bad a little, thing. A little bit of maintenance, yes, because I did try to listen to a cassette tape a couple of weeks ago, and it was yeah. it definitely needs a head cleaning. It sounded like this. Well, in this case, it's like, oh, maybe a 25-year-old tape, so... Mm -hmm. Yeah, might need a little... uh... Maybe I'll be buying it on Audible. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I might be, too. We'll see what happens. Uh, Maybe. (laughs) So, fingers crossed. All right, so uh, come on back, and uh, we'll be right here on Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast. Bye, everybody. Bye.